Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Before this week, when I heard that name, that nickname, the word manifesto popped up in my head. Picture that infamous police sketch of some creepy-ass mustachioed dude in a hoodie wearing some aviator sunglasses. I imagine a bearded, wild-eyed maniac living alone in a remote Montana cabin making and mailing bombs. And that was about all I knew. Know a whole bunch more now. I know the full story of a man who started off with so, so much potential, a literal genius with an IQ of 167 who studied at Harvard, started studying when he was only 16 years old, a guy who had a doctorate in mathematics by the age of 25. His doctoral thesis written at the University of Michigan is considered a mathematical work of art. Ted could have lived such a good life. He was a young, handsome professor at the age of 25, had a good childhood, support a family, no abuse, lots of opportunity. He became the youngest assistant professor of mathematics in the history of the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught undergraduate courses in geometry and calculus. Teaching at Berkeley in 1967, he had a good job at a young age in the beating heart of the counterculture movement during the summer of love. He could have lived so many people's ultimate fantasy. That was maybe the best year and place to be single and under 30 in all of human history. And he could have cared less, right? Just did not care at all. Two years later, this increasingly anti-social loner walked away from academia forever. After two years, uh, another two years, he walked away from civilization in general and moved out into the Montana wilderness. And then he got real, real weird. Decided he didn't like how uh, reliant society was becoming on technology and industry. Felt like everyone needed to get back to basics, Felt it was time to live simply off the land again. And he started mailing off bombs to kick off a revolution that was supposed to change the world. Well, he didn't change the world. But he did create a fascinating story for today's. There's a fine line between genius and insanity. Bearded maniac in the woods edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, time suckers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks to our space lizards again for supporting the show via Patreon and for coming out to the uh, Salt Lake City Live Ant Hill Kids Suck a little over a week ago. God, that was fun. Uh, Use some of your Patreon money recently to buy new equipment for the Suck Dungeon to improve the sound quality of the YouTube Suck videos. Now the audio on YouTube also coming from the studio mic, not from the shotgun mic on the camera. Hail Nimrod. I'm Dan Cummins, the Master Sucker, the Suck Master, Socrates, and you are listening to Time Suck. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Hail Nimrod. Uh, hail Lucifina. Been hailing her a lot uh, more lately instead of telling her to, to get out of here. Instead of saying, begone. Praise Triple M and praise Bojangles. Let's have some fun today. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by Season 2 of the Breach Podcast. What makes a, a data breach the worst breach of all time? How about losing our social security numbers? the keys to our identities? How about losing 145 million of them? No bueno. Not fun to have your info out there so someone can hack into your bank account, hack into your cloud storage, maybe find some clean wean picks you'd rather not have out there and possibly take so much more. Breach is a podcast that takes you inside the world's biggest hacks, how they're done, who does them, and what's really at stake when your private data is compromised. And this season, they're investigating the worst breach ever, Equifax. Who might have your credit info? Uh, You know, not good. And so many of us live on credit. Try buying a a car or house without a good score because someone's messed it up by stealing your identity. So listen to season two of The Breach, the Equifax story. This time, it's personal. Subscribe to Breach. That's B-R-E-A-C-H in your podcast app right now. Uh, Get in some extra learning. Uh, Thanks again. To all the new listeners who have been trying out Time Suck lately, numbers been soaring. Thanks for giving me the confidence to buy ads on other podcasts. Hail Nimrod, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I know there's a lot of options for what you can put in your ear vaginas out there, and I appreciate you letting us uh, penetrate yours. Uh, this is the first podcast I've recorded since uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, yeah, I know I already said thank you, but man, those shows were so fun. Not just the live podcast, the stand-up shows, the happy murder shows. Late Show Saturday, that stand-up show, one of my favorite stand-up shows uh, just ever. Love you suckers. The energy was electric. Um, So we have uh, no more happy murder dates for a few weeks. I'm going to be off to Florida this week to head on a free cruise with uh, Queen of the Suck. Going to be on the Mediocre Time with Tom and Dan Cruz, March 7th through the 11th. Love those guys. Love their podcast. Can't wait. Next, uh, stand-up shows are also in Florida. 
I'll be at the Off the Hook Comedy Club in Naples, Florida, March 28th, first time there. And then the Miami Improv, uh, first time in a long time. I, no, I think it is actually my first time in that particular club. And sa- Saturday, March 30th. Then I'll be in the uh, Queen of the Suck of uh, Lindsay's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, the Warsaw of America, April 4th through 6th, uh, with another live Ant Hill Kids Suck on Cleveland on April 6th. Uh, or in Cleveland on April 6th. Lindsay will be there too. Uh, Des Moines, April 11th. Kansas City, April 12th and 13th. Dallas, Texas, the 26th. Houston, Texas, 27th. Then San Francisco, Boston, Spokane, Jacksonville, and more. The rest of the dates at dancombs.tv. Now, let's blow this suck the fuck up. It's Unabomber time, meet sex. Uh, no real context to lay down for this one. Today's, today's suck is, is pretty damn chronological. Uh, Ted wasn't a product of his times or his time. You know, he was, he was a product of a, a very, very unique, highly intelligent, and extremely twisted brain. So let's just get right to it. Let's get right into the life of one of America's most infamous domestic terrorists in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. May 22nd, 1942. Theodore John Kaczynski was the first child born in Chicago to blue collar, second generation Polish Americans, Theodore Turk and Wanda Kaczynski. So, uh, Polish people, you know? Ugh. Of course, of course they would give uh, birth to a monster like Ted Kaczynski. Uh, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, uh, Hitler, Kim Jong-un, Stalin, Pol Pot, Dahmer, uh, Chikatilo, Ronald McDonald, uh, Donald McDonald, uh, Donald McRonald, Gremlins, The Joker, The Penguin, Dr. Doom, uh, the one dude at the gas station who gives me the heebie-jeebies, uh, 98% of sex offenders, all Polish. Uh, a recent study that I found in a place you don't even know about just proved that. It was conducted by some doctors you've never heard of and you can't find anywhere. Because Google won't allow the results to be found because Google is also Polish. Uh, Google's original name, uh, Google Ski. They dropped a ski to make it more palatable. Uh, I don't need to say I'm kidding, do I? I don't, I don't think so. I hope not. Uh, Kaczynski's parents were really second-generation Polish. That's true. Ted was initially a happy and healthy baby when he suffered a terrible outbreak of hives when he was six months old. It put him in the hospital for eight months. It, it might have scrambled his noodle a little bit. Uh, now I have something new to be afraid of. Uh, I, I didn't think it was possible for hives to put you in the hospital for anywhere near that long. Uh, yeah, I got hives once in college for like, I don't know, two days. Allergic reaction to penicillin. My mom my mom refuses to acknowledge that I'm in fact allergic to penicillin to this day. Uh, as, as if I wasn't told by an actual doctor, Mother, you get my zap was really angry, Mother. You're lucky you don't have a cat. Hard not to slip into uh, Ed Kemper from time to time now. Anyway, hives, also known as uh, urtic. Urtic, oh my God, I hate some of these words. Urticaria, urticaria, urticaria. There we go. Hives is a little easier to say than urticaria. It's a swollen uh, or outbreak of swollen pale red bumps, also known as plaques or wheels on the skin that appear suddenly either as the result of the body's reaction to certain allergens or for unknown reasons. Super sexy. Hives usually cause itching, but may also burn or sting. They can appear anywhere on the body, including the face, lips, tongue, throat, or ears. Hives vary in size from the size of a pencil eraser to the size of a dinner plate. Ugh. May join together to form uh, larger areas known as plaques. They can last for hours, uh, up to one day before fading. Hives can also be accompanied by swelling, which can kill you if swelling constricts your airway, for example. And, and usually you get hives from an allergic reaction to something like nuts, chocolate, fish, tomatoes, eggs, fresh berries, milk, certain insect bites, medications can cause hives. But you can also get chronic uh, urticaria like baby Ted did. Uh, for who knows why. Nobody knows. It just It's very mysterious. It just happens sometimes. Chronic, uh, urti- or, uh, Jesus Christ, urticaria, uh, or hives lasting more than six weeks. Cause of this type of hives is usually very difficult to identify. And in fact, uh, it's, it's impossible to determine why they show up in, in many cases. So young Ted, stressful first two years on earth, separated from his parents, left in a hospital bed to be alone much of the time. Not good for his brain uh, when it came to social development. Not good for psychological health. Human babies are born, obviously, super dependent on their parents. Babies undergo huge brain development, growth, and neuron pruning during the first two years of life. And this brain development, as as well as uh, social, emotional, and cognitive development, depends a great deal on a loving bond or attachment relationship with a primary caregiver, usually a parent. 
Uh, there's increasing evidence from the fields of developmental psych uh, psychology, neurobiology, animal uh, epigenetic studies that neglect parental inconsistency and a lack of love can lead to long-term mental health problems as well as to reduced overall potential and happiness. So hug your babies. Spend time with your babies. Don't put them in a little, uh, you know, baby carrier and just let, let, you know, don't put baby in a corner. You heard, you heard uh, Patrick Swayze, right? You, you watch Dirty Dancing. No one puts baby in a corner. Okay, don't do that. Some people do put babies in corners and it doesn't help the babies. And then, um, yeah, this early hospital stay may have truly affected Ted's social and psychological developments. Pretty negative ways. Ex in extreme cases, severe emotional neglect from an infant's primary caregiver can, can lead to a condition known as failure to thrive. I remember studying about that years ago in college. It was so sad. Uh, decelerated or even arrested physical growth, height and weight measurements can fall below the third or fifth percentile. Basically like a plant no one waters, a child can stop growing if it's not given uh, enough attention and love. Emotional neglect can lead to various attachment disorders, make it easier for someone to form, uh, um, you know, if, uh, make it harder, excuse me, for someone to form uh, meaningful relationships when they're, uh, when they're an adult later. Something Ted would for sure struggle with. A uh, dude had basically no meaningful relationships uh, once he got into his, you know, mid-20s and didn't have a lot before then. Uh, when Ted came home from the hospital on, in March of 1943, his mother would write, baby home from hospital and is healthy but quite unresponsive after his experience. Quite unresponsive. Interesting note. Uh, later in his childhood, Ted was shown photographs of when he was an infant uh, being held down by doctors examining his hives. He would become overwhelmed, anxious, and disgruntled. Young Ted also exhibited heightened uh, sympathy to caged animals, seemingly understanding the pain of forced captivity and isolation. Those hives left quite the mental scars on Ted. From grades one through four, Kaczynski attended Sherman Elementary School in Chicago. He's a bit of a loner. Otherwise exhibited no obvious social problems outside of not really having uh, any close friends at this time. Uh, he was super smart. On October 3rd, 1949, when Ted is seven, his younger brother, David Kaczynski, is born. Ted and David get along normally as children. Years later, though, David would end up playing a crucial role in Ted getting arrested after one of the longest and most expensive FBI manhunts in history. 1952, Ted's family of four moves to Evergreen Park. Uh, Evergreen Park, Illinois, a southern suburb of Chicago, initially settled primarily by Germans who, uh, I don't know if you know this, God's second least favorite race behind Polish, uh, according to most uh, theological experts. On the list of God, uh, who God hates most, uh, the list that I've seen, Polish people number one, German people number two, and then for some reason, Eskimos are third. I don't know why. Uh, I just pass along what, what Nimrod uh, tells me to say. So hail Nimrod. Uh, no. After the, after the move to a new school, Ted became notably more engaged, social, and happy. This was a nice little window in his life. For whatever reason, Ted just clicked with these new kids in his fifth grade class, found a nice little social group for himself where he had friends, felt respected, but this new social acceptance would only last about a year because his new school, noticing how incredibly academically intelligent he was, made him take a, an IQ test, and he scored a 167. If you'll recall, genius-level IQ is considered to begin around 140, 145. Serial killer Ed Kemper, mother, I'm very angry by my zapples. That guy tested as high as 145. And Ted just knocked out 167. Uh, I go back and forth on whether or not I want to have my IQ tested. I'm not going to lie. I, uh, maybe it shouldn't matter. I'd be pretty bummed if I took that test and I got like an 85. I'm like, fucking 85? Seriously? Ugh. Go play some Red Dead. Make me feel good. Uh, chess legend Bobby Fischer, also from Chicago, by the way, born in 1943, also alleged to have an IQ of 167. Guy who's known for being pretty sharp. Uh, very sharp when he was a young man. Uh, teachers and administrators decided to accelerate Ted's education. He skipped sixth grade. Ted wasn't happy with the decision. He had just developed meaningful friendships with his peers. He was considered a leader. After the jump, the younger than his classmates now, Ted, uh, found himself getting picked on and bullied. Went from having a large group of friends uh, to being a social pariah, to being an outcast. I actually worried about a similar situation with my son, Kyler, when he was younger. We, we've never had his IQ tested either, but he, he's incredibly academically gifted. I'm sure his IQ is quite a bit higher than mine. Uh, we had him skip second grade. He switched into a program in his school for advanced kids. And then the teacher recommended him for a different school for advanced kids. And he tested into that. Uh, and, I was, and I was worried about him being a social pariah at this new school. Luckily, he seems to get along uh, with all those other nerds and uh, dorks and dweebs and weirdos. Uh, he could easily skip a few more grades, but we're not going to allow that. Not going to push that on him because luckily he, he's big for his age. He's the same size as his classmates now, but 
I just don't think the social repercussions, potential social repercussions of being significantly younger and smaller than your classmates is worth that type of accelerated, uh, you know, kind of education and graduation. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'd be fine. But I just think like you only get one childhood. Like what's, what's, I mean, honestly, what's the big rush? Um, Ted would attend grades five through eight at Evergreen Park Central School. While there, he developed a fear of other people, started playing beside other kids rather than interacting with them. That's, that's kind of a red flag, got some social issues. His mother was so worried about his poor social development that she considered entering him into a study for autistic children. Too bad she wasn't able to do so. There's a lot of armchair kind of psychiatric speculation that Ted may indeed be on the autistic spectrum. Some think he has Asperger's syndrome, uh, a developmental disorder characterized by significant difficulties in social interaction and nonverbal communication, along with restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior and interests. Uh, he's never been officially tested and diagnosed, though. Uh, 1955, Ted entered Evergreen Park Community High School, where he excelled academically, of course. Uh, he joined a variety of groups, including the math, coin, German, and biology clubs. He also played the trombone in the school's band as if he wasn't having enough uh, social problems. Uh, somehow, he was able to acquire a small group of friends who shared his interest in math and science and were able to overlook his interest in the trombone, an interest about as, about as sexy and cool as the guitar or maybe the accordion, an instrument uh, not even close to as sexy as the air banjo. Ugh. Uh, Ted even played the trombone in the marching band as if being way smarter than everyone, younger and socially awkward, didn't already make it hard enough to meet a girl. Uh, Ted was considered quiet and shy outside of this small group of friends. He was also widely considered the most intelligent student in his high school, especially when it came to math. He became obsessed with mathematics, spending prolonged hours locked in his room practicing differential equations instead of socializing with his peers. He quickly far surpassed the mathematical abilities of his classmates, able to solve advanced Laplace transforms before his senior year. And, and what is a Laplace transform, you ask? Well, it is a series of exponentially increasing fractions that also operate as prime numbers that can be converted into integral algorithms and subverted and folded into theoretical chemical compounds that act as placeholders or Laplace holders for helium-infused particles when... Uh, that magnetically conducts subatomic acceleration if left in a vacuum or nightstand or hung from a keychain. And if you know more about math than me, you know that what I said was complete gibberish. I just strung together a lot of big words, and I don't know what some of them mean. Uh, no, a, a Laplace transform is an integral transform. Uh, it's not a transformer. That'd be fucking cooler. Named after its inventor, Pierre uh, Simon Laplace, it takes a function of a real variable, T off in time, to a function of a complex variable S, complex frequency. And if you have any fucking idea what that means whatsoever, you are much more educated than I am when it comes to math. That entire, uh, the real definition was still gibberish to me. Made about as much sense as uh, my nonsense definition. Might as well have been defined as a molecular hyperbole that divides itself by multiple gerbils when it feels threatened or tries to wormhole through the moon matrix. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's reasonable. Uh, Ted took the most difficult math classes his high school offered yet still felt unchallenged. I cannot relate to that. I took the easiest math class offered by Gonzaga University, like the one that all the uh, athletes and the uh, liberal arts majors like myself took, uh, still challenged. And he wasn't just good at math. He, he was good at all of his classes, better than good. He was exceptional. He was one of only five national merit scholars at his high school. Ted received an accelerated education and course load, ended up also skipping the 11th grade. Then he took additional summer classes that allowed him to graduate when he was just 15 years old in the fall of 1957. He was encouraged to apply for Harvard and uh, was accepted into Harvard and set to begin classes there in 1958. Not only was he accepted, he was also given a substantial scholarship to Harvard. To Harvard, <laughs> uh, when he's, you know, 16 years old. So he moves to Boston, enrolls in the Ivy League school at only 16 years old. Uh, beyond academically impressive, while at Harvard, Kaczynski would be taught by famed logician. Ah, it's like logic. Lo I hate this word. I think it's, it's like a logic. It's like if you crossed a, a magician with someone who's good at logic. I think it's a logician. <laughs> uh, you know what? I didn't put the phonetic one in for that one. Logic, I-A-N, whatever. William, Van, Orman, Quinn. Uh, it was the guy who taught this. He, and he scored at the top of Quinn's class with a 98.9% final grade. Scoring 98.9% in a class. Not one piece of me begins to understand. I can't even pronounce the type of math it is. And he's doing this despite being a couple years younger than most, if not all of his classmates, in fucking Harvard. 
genius, kicking ass at math. He also uh, suffers psychologically at Harvard. Some shady ass experiments conducted at Harvard would uh, help twist a young, insanely gifted yet fragile mathematical mind into a future domestic terrorist. First those hives, now he gets his powerful noodle scrambled at Harvard. In 1959, during Kaczynski's sophomore year, he was recruited for a psychological experiment that unbeknownst to him would last for three years. The multiple year personality study was conducted by Dr. Henry Murray, an expert on stress interviews, and quite possibly uh, based on some of the experiments he conducted and the way he conducted them, also an asshole. Uh, the study that involved uh, Ted was sponsored by the Central Intelligence Agency. You got the CIA doing this study. 22 students are, uh, participate, and they're told that they would be just debating personal philosophy with a fellow student. Instead, they were subjected to a purposely brutalizing psychological experiment stress test, which was an extremely stressful, personal, and prolonged psychological attack. During the test, students were taken into a room, strapped into a chair, connected to electrodes that monitored their physiological reactions while facing bright lights in a two-way mirror. Henry Murray's experiment was intended to measure how people react under stress. The CIA backed it because it wanted to find out how to weed out potential agents for being too psychologically weak to withstand interrogation from the enemy. Each student had previously written an essay detailing their personal beliefs and aspirations, like their core values. These essays were turned over to an anonymous attorney who would enter the room and just belittle a strapped down student uh, based in part on the disclosures they had made. And then this was filmed, and then the students' expressions of impotent rage were then played back to them several times later in the study. Just some weird, like, clockwork orange type shit going on at Harvard. Years later, Kaczynski's uh, uh, lawyers would attribute some of his emotional instability to his participation in this exact study. I mean, I bet he's 17 years old when this starts. He's strapped into a chair. He's screamed at by some asshole making fun of everything he's ever believed in or wanted to do. Uh, he then has his reactions to being bullied, thrown back in his face. Pretty fucked up. Uh, and, and, you know, and he was fucked, uh, fucked with in this experiment off and on for three years, from 17 to 20. You know, when, you, when he's trying to figure out who he is and how he fits into the world. Over three years, Kaczynski logged over 200 hours of being psychologically abused in this study. And, and Kaczynski is claimed to have had the worst physiological reactions of anyone who participated. Uh, this is the guy who hated feeling trapped as a kid, the guy who empathized with caged animals. He should have, you know, um, been screened uh, beforehand and not allowed to participate in this study. He was too fragile. The experiments paired with his lack of social skills and memories of being bullied as a child caused Kaczynski to suffer from horrible nightmares while at Harvard. And uh, was his mind also being altered and messed with with LSD uh, during some of these interro uh, interrogations? I mean, that's not confirmed, but I think it's possible. This is when the CIA was working on their MK Ultra mind control experiments. If you will recall uh, from the MK Ultra suck, bonus suck eight while back now, we know the CIA was conducting LSD experiments at this time. Uh, they also conducted experiments at Harvard around this time, right? We also know they didn't uh, necessarily tell whoever they dosed with LSD that they had been dosed. Kaczynski himself would reveal much later in life that a distrust of authority and some anarchist fantasies began to manifest themselves in his mind around this time. Yeah, I bet they did. He started fantasizing about fucking with people in the government that fucked with him. 1962, 20-year-old Kaczynski graduates from Harvard with a bachelor's in mathematics. He moves to Ann Arbor, Michigan to continue his mathematical studies at the University of Michigan, where he'd been given a substantial grant and a guaranteed teaching position. He specializes in complex analysis with a focus on geometric function theory, whatever that means. He was muchier, gooder than meer in numbersers. Uh, professors at Michigan were astounded by his drive and commitment to academics. One professor, Peter Duran, when describing Kaczynski, later stated, he was an unusual person. He was not like the other graduate students. He was much more focused on blowing motherfuckers up. I remember thinking that that was weird. That's not what he said. He did say he was unusual, though, and he also said he was much more focused on, uh, on his work. He had a drive to discover mathematical truth. Uh, professors also claimed that describing him as merely smart was insulting. It was incredibly simplified and demeaning. He was far more than smart. He was a genius. He was passionate about his studies, pursued his work to a higher goal than most, if not all, of his peers. While he was in Michigan, he also taught classes and worked on his Ph.D. dissertation, which was highly praised. He won the University of Michigan's highly prestigious Sumner B. Myers Prize awarded to the top mathematics dissertation each year. Uh, the dissertation was widely considered an absolute masterpiece among the best written in the history of the University of Michigan. He followed up his dissertation with two journal articles before he left the University of Michigan, later published three more. 
I could read you some of those experts or excerpts, but I don't want to either A, fall asleep while recording my own podcast, or B, get so angry that I have no idea what's being talked about that I start punching holes in the walls of the Suck Dungeon. 1967, Kaczynski earned his doctorate degree from the University of Michigan, moved west to teach at the University of California, Berkeley. Kaczynski, at the age of 25, became the youngest assistant mathematics professor in the university in the history of the University of California, Berkeley. Not too shabby, man. Dude is on academic fire and fuego. Uh, although uh, greatly respected by faculty stu- uh, students, however, despite only being a few years younger than him, did not care for Ted. He was a brilliant mind, but he was a terrible professor. Uh, this is Berkeley in 1967. I mean, if I could be like single in 19 at one point in all of human history, if I could pick a place at a time, it literally might be Berkeley in the summer of 1967. Free love. You know, this is, this is the summer of free love, the height of the hippie counterculture movement. Hot, barefoot, bohemian co-eds, long flowing dresses, flowers in their thick, luxurious, beautiful hair. No bras, no moral hangups on sexuality. Hail Lucifina, so much weed. Uh, the birth control pill, no AIDS, lots of incredible music. The Doors singing Light My Fire, get the fuck out. The Beatles singing Strawberry Fields Forever. Jimi Hendrix thrown down of six was nine. The Rolling Stones sing Let's Spend the Night Together. Drugs, sex, rock and roll. I, I can feel Lucifina in the room with me right now. Her presence is strong. She loved 1967. Let's bring it all down, set the world on fire, party like you're never going to die, fuck like there's no tomorrow. Berkeley is the lustful beating heart of all of this. And Ted is there with a good job at a cool school. And he's 25. He could have lived the best possible life one could lead in 1967. Should have been having threesomes and dropping acid, you know, attending music festivals. Instead, he's just annoyed that his students don't understand math as good as he does. Captain geometric function theory talking about Laplace transforms and a bunch of other shit no one cares about. Talking about it in the most robotic, emotionless way possible. Ugh. Ted was a rigid, unapproachable, off-putting professor. He never answered questions. He was known for teaching verbatim from textbooks. He had no use for students who couldn't just get it like he did. I would have hated this dude if he was my professor. I mean, whether intentional or not, it, he just came across like a pretentious, distant, you know, asshole. And since I can't find a single mention of even one romantic interest from young Ted's life, you know, he was a sexually frustrated, pretentious asshole, arguably the worst kind. He, he, he kept his wing too clean. Maybe he wouldn't have, you know, sent out some bombs later if he would just got his dick a little dirtier. Take the edge off. On June 30th, 1969, Ted unexpectedly resigned from teaching, never gave the school a reason for leaving. Peers and colleagues suggested that had he remained, he would have been promoted to a senior faculty position. Uh, Despite being a terrible professor, they wanted him around just because he was so damn smart. Uh, Some think he walked away uh, (laughs) because, um, you know, he's probably just allergic to fun and he got bored. Uh, No, uh, but some people think he way or think he walked away, excuse me, because he'd figured out all the equations that he knew how to kind of look into. Like, how insane is that? Most major innovations and theories in mathematics have been proven uh, by the 1960s, and there just wasn't very many new frontiers left for him to study. Uh, I don't claim to understand this. In his particular field of mathematics, Ted had mastered uh, pretty much everything, and and this particular field was becoming outdated and antiquated, and just people weren't interested in pursuing it further. Uh, The way it's written, it reminds me of, like, Michael Jordan walking away from basketball at the height of his power, right? Because it's fucking dominating. I just become boring. Can you can you imagine being that good at anything, dude? You don't have sex anymore ever? Nah, it's, nah. I just I uh, mastered it. It's too good, you know. It just wasn't fun. I remember I stopped right after I gave uh, ten different women multiple simultaneous orgasms back in 2016. Used to uh, use my penis, uh, my mouth, different fingers, some toes and knee, a lot of flexibility, and I didn't even break sweat. Two of them actually died uh, from a pleasure overdose. Uh, doctors didn't even know that was possible until that evening. Meanwhile, I was just daydreaming about uh, what I was going to watch afterwards on Netflix. You know, shit just got too easy. got boring. I just didn't, didn't care about it. Uh, Kaczynski moved to go live with his parents after he left. Go, went to Lombard, Illinois in 1969. He stayed there for two years working odd jobs, trying to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. He longed to get away from civilization, away from people, people who either irritated him or who just didn't largely trust. He wanted to get away from the system that tormented him at Harvard. He decided to go off the grid, but where should he go? He finally picked Lincoln, Montana. Less than 80 miles east of Montana's big college town, Missoula, a city only two and a half hours uh, drive from the Suck Dungeon here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Lincoln, super remote, small town of about 1,000 people. He bought some land, 1.4 acres uh, to be exact, outside of Lincoln with the help of his brother David. 
If you know the area, he, he bought some land in Florence Gulch within a mile of Stemple Pass Road. Reminds me of people who, uh, who uh, have land outside of Riggins, Idaho, where I grew up. You know, you, you can still go into town for supplies when you need them. But when you're home, if you've got some acreage, you might as well be on another uh, uninhabited planet. You can't even hear other human, you know, ev- evidence of human life. Can't see anything made by humans. 1971, Ted built a remote primitive cabin on his land outside of Lincoln. No electricity, no running water. His goal was to become self-sufficient, live off the land, carve out a simple existence. And back then, it wouldn't take uh, much money to do that. My dad worked as a logger in Riggins, Idaho, uh, which really isn't that far from Lincoln. Maybe a six-hour drive, very similar culture, similar geography. I'm guessing very similar real estate prices. My dad said you could buy a plot of land back then, like in the, what, like the early, you know, mid-70s, uh, a little city lot for, for less than a thousand bucks easy. Like if that sounds crazy, the median value of a home sold in the United States in 1970 was $17,000. And that's factoring in Los Angeles and Manhattan prices. And, that, and that's factoring in a home, like a, a home built on the land. Raw land in bumfuck Montana, under $1,000, easy. And if you built some little cabin with no electricity, no running water, just drinking out of a creek, hoping not to get dysentery and hear McGill's pop, you could live for next to nothing. Especially if you grew and, you know, grew your own food and hunted your own food like Ted did. Ted didn't care about TV or the movies or going out to eat. Uh, he rode a bike to the uh, local library reading classics in their original languages, like a, like a weird, you know, backwoods cabin genius does, lived beyond frugally. Uh, to make some money, he worked the occasional odd job, you know, here and there, helping mend this fence, helping split this firewood, that kind of shit, uh, riding his bicycle to and from town. Even studied survivalist topics from uh, tracking game to edible plants and organic farming. Uh, some of the locals didn't mind him. He creeped others out. Uh, regarding what locals thought of Ted, longtime Unabomber neighbor Chris Waits would say, most were friendly, uh, but respected his need for privacy and kept their distance. Some avoided him as they would a tramp, and he gladly avoided them, occasionally crossing the street so they wouldn't have to say hello to the bearded, often unkempt, and sometimes smelly recluse. Uh, Chris would go on to co-author a book about Ted called Unabomber, The Secret Life of Ted Kaczynski. Chris was Ted Kaczynski's friend and neighbor in the Montana mountains for 25 years. ABC News called him the man who knew to, uh, who knew Ted best. Uh, Chris was also the guy who had nine different dogs uh, likely killed by Ted, which says a lot about the friendship. Uh, Ted didn't have friends. He was the ultimate recluse. Uh, Chris was his neighbor, and when Chris's dogs would wander onto Ted's property, uh, he often they often died. More more on that more on that later in this story. Um, Ted pulled off his reclusive lifestyle for a long time. He lived for over two decades. As a, as a happy, anti-social math whiz, uh, living in the woods, shitting in an outhouse, like some kind of Frontier Days pioneer reenactment actor. Uh, by 1975, however, Kaczynski decided it was impossible to live peacefully in nature because of the destruction of the wilderness around his cabin by real estate development and industrial projects. Here we go. There he starts transitioning to the Unabomber. Um, he begins performing acts of environmental sabotage against nearby developments in 1975, becomes an eco-terrorist. We had those around Riggins, too, when I grew up. You know, and definitely a little bit before I uh, was born. People spiking trees. So loggers chainsaws would get fucked up when they hit that metal. Putting sugar in gas tanks to ruin engines on logging equipment, that kind of thing. Uh, Roaming on foot and on bicycle in a 25-mile radius from his cabin, Lincoln's environmental radical, according to several sources, booby-trapped motorcycle trails with wire strung between trees, sabotaged mining machinery with sand, burned logging equipment, poured sugar into snowmobile gas tanks, Destroyed hunting and mining camps and vacation cabins uh, with his axe. No bombs yet, but clearly just living by his own moral code that exists far outside the law at this point. It's clearly going a little off the rails. That Montana neighbor Chris Waits would later say after Kaczynski was captured that, uh, uh, oh yeah, let's talk about these dogs for a second. Uh, Ted killed nine of his dogs over a decade, largely by poisoning them with strychnine. Uh, Mr. Waite said he had heard Mr. Kaczynski curse the dogs whose barking may have betrayed Ted's location in the woods, probably when he's trying to do these acts of sabotage. Ted confessed to at least one of these killings years later in a rambling letter written in prison. Fucking Ted, man. You know, at some points in the story, I started, I was feeling a little sorry for him, but uh, but this, man, you, you waste a summer of love, and now you kill dogs. Justifying their deaths, I'm sure, is part of your strange, misguided, and futile quest to keep technology from destroying nature. Now Bojangles hate your guts. Time sucks resident one-eyed, three-legged pit bull, defender of freedom, wants to raise one of his legs, piss on your crazy bearded mountain man face right now. After a few years of environmental sabotage, Ted decides to take things further. He decides to build bombs, target those who are considered adversarial to his objectives and goals to bring down what he called the techno-industrial system, which he believed to be enslaving the human race. 
And to really understand Ted's motivation for his acts of terrorism, we need to take a look at what he is most known for outside of bombs. And that's his manifesto. We're going to jump ahead real quick to the manifesto in 1995. Uh, and then we'll come back to the timeline. The rest, you know, we'll pick up where we left off at the time. And Ted would, Ted would mail a 35,000-word manifesto he'd been working on for over a decade to several major U.S. media outlets, including the Washington Post and the New York Times, explaining why he was bombing people. The essay was titled Industrial Society in Its Future and was dubbed the Unabomber Manifesto by the FBI. Uh, he stated that if the manifesto was printed in its entirety, he would desist from terrorism. Uh, originally, Bob Gucci, uh, Guccione of uh, Penthouse volunteered to publish it, but Kaczynski replied that Penthouse was less respectable than the other publications. Instead, he would reserve the right to plant one and only one bomb intended to kill after the manuscripts had been published, if it was published in Penthouse. Uh, instead, the essay was published by both the New York Times and Washington Post on September 19th, 1995. I, I love that he did agree to stop if Penthouse published it, but only after one more bomb because Penthouse is less than respectable. I do not want to denigrate Penthouse, and it does indeed have a national distribution, so I will stop bombing if they print it. I'm a man of my word, but I will stop bombing only after I send one more bomb. And the blood of that bomb is on penthouse. The, the blood is on the publication distributing full penetration pornography, making it less respectable. Uh, pornography that includes photos of penises being inserted into anal sphincters in glossy, airbrushed, well-let detail that I personally think is a bit much. Uh, penthouse, man. That, that's where I saw full penetration for the first time in a penthouse magazine that someone had placed in a grocery bag and left out in the woods outside of Riggins, Idaho. Not kidding. Old school bag in the woods porn. My friends, Kyler and Chance, they found out about the bag somehow. I think their older brother, John, told them about it. I don't, I don't, I don't know who first put it in the woods. Maybe St. Penthouse. Maybe the, the patron saint of full pe penetration. Uh, my mind was blown. I, was, I remember being so confused. I remember looking over their shoulders. We were all crouched down. Look, I remember looking over Kyler and Chance's shoulders and I was just so confused by the, the sight of an erect penis in a woman's butt. I just recently seen a picture of a penis going into a vagina. And that hole, after some explaining, did make sense to me. But butt? Where your, where your poop comes out? I didn't even know that was anatomically possible until that day. And instead of being disgusted, well, new fantasy was born. Hail uh, How many holes can a penis go into? But we're not talking about mean holes. Uh, we're talking about the Unabomber. Uh, here, here is the beginning of his manifesto that at times made sense to me, uh, which at times made me concerned about my own mental health. He starts off, the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. They have greatly increased the life expectancy of those of us who live in advanced countries, but they have destabilized society, have made life unfulfilling, have subjected human beings to indignities, have led to widespread psychological suffering in the third world to physical suffering as well and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. The continued development of technology will worsen the situation. It will certainly subject human beings to greater indignities and inflict greater damage on the natural world. It will probably lead to greater social disruption and psychological suffering. And it may lead to increased physical suffering, even in quote unquote advanced countries. You know, uh, for a genius, for a guy who spent a lot of time in the woods reading book after book, old Teddy K uh, didn't seem to know much about real history like medieval history, Roman history, ancient Mongolian history, virtually any kind of ancient history. Has the Industrial Revolution subjected human beings to greater indignities than medieval serfdom? Is that true? I don't think so. Are third world factories, you know, uh, you know, third world factory workers, are, are they worse off than the uh, Wallachian peasants were in the 15th century during the reign of Vlad the Impaler? I doubt it. And, and what about to pick one of many examples, the medicinal advances of Western medicine that have accompanied, that have accompanied the Industrial Revolution? Has that not improved life immensely? Are we not glad to no longer need to rely on plague doctors? I wonder if Ted would have written this manifesto if he would have suffered like some major health problems while living in his shitty backwoods cabin. You know, you're still going to be promoting that primitive life, still going to think it's fantastic when you're dying of cancer? You're going to go, you going to head to the city, get treated by an actual fucking doctor in a real hospital? Or are you going to just rub some herbs and roots on your tumor? In your shitty cabin. Ah, this cabin was shitty, by the way. I looked at photos, and I would be embarrassed to have it in my backyard as a shed. I can't believe he lived in it for so many years. If, uh, if destroying the techno-industrial system means having to live in a shitty Unabomber cabin shed, for sure out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. 
Then Ted says, the industrial technological system may survive or it may break down. If it survives, it may eventually achieve a low level of physical and psychological suffering, but only after passing through a long and very painful period of adjustment and only at the cost of permanently reducing human beings and many other living organisms to engineered products and mere cogs in the social machine. Furthermore, if the system survives, the consequences will be inevitable. There is no way of reforming or modifying the system so as to prevent it from depriving people of dignity and autonomy. Cogs in the social machine. Yeah, I mean, that, that is what we are, Ted. But, but, but is that necessarily uh, inherently a bad thing? You know, not everybody wants to live completely alone in the woods like a bearded fucking maniac. Some people enjoy being dependent on one another. Uh, yes, uh, most of us whose emotional makeup wasn't cooked and scrambled by a bad outbreak of hives when we were a baby and then twisted further by mind control and interrogation experiments actually crave some sort of relationship with the outside world. I can be antisocial uh, as hell, but I would never want to live in a cabin entirely alone with nothing but books and my thoughts to keep me company. Sounds like a fun week-long vacation. Does not sound like a good long-term way of living. I get that this guy wanted to be left alone, but now he's trying to push his extremely left of center lifestyle in the rest of the world. That's what I always hate with these fucking maniacs. It's like they have their ideas and maybe there's some validity to their ideas. And that's fine for them. But why do we all have to live that way? Why did Ted feel so arrogant, you know, I guess maybe because of his intelligence that, you know, this is the way that everyone needs to live. Uh, you know why there weren't a lot of other people living in a remote uh, handmade cabin around you, Ted? It's because because uh, they didn't want to. It's not because they couldn't figure it out. They would rather live as hard as it may be to imagine because Ted is still alive. If somehow he could hear this. I doubt he listens to the podcast, but... Yeah, they would rather live in an apartment in a city surrounded by people and, and choices of entertainment and food options and all that kind of than, than live in some Unabomber Looney Tune cabin. A lot of people prefer that. People prefer the suburbs. Some people love the suburbs. Some people love their studio apartment in Soho. Fucking maniac, man. As smart as he was mathematically, moron when it came to understanding the diversity of human desires. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead now in his rambling manifesto and just pick a few more experts because it's, it's so long. Uh, he says, we therefore advocate a revolution against the industrial system. This revolution may or may not make use of violence. It may be sudden or it may be a relatively gradual process spanning a few decades. I love his use of we here. We advocate. Uh, I think you mean me. Uh, close, but not we. You're alone. No one's in that cabin with you. Uh, not sure who you think is joining this revolution. Not sure what voices uh, the voices in your head are talking to you about right now. He says, this is not to be a political revolution. Its object will be to overthrow not governments, but the economic and technological basis of the present society. Yeah, good luck with that. I actually think it would be easier to overthrow the government than it would, uh, like, than it would be to get people to overthrow uh, their dependence on technology, right? Like some anarchist might be like, no, you're going gonna to overthrow the government? Okay, hell yeah, man, whatever. Fucking rage against the machine, all that shit, let's do it. Bunch of crooked politicians in bed with big pharma, corporate America, let's shake shit up. Yeah, let's do this. Oh, uh, wait, what? I'm sorry, what, what did you say? You, you want me to toss away my iPhone? You want me, you want me to throw away my MacBook? I, I watch Netflix on that. You, you want to take my PS4? I can't play Red Dead Redemption? You, my, my F-150, I don't even get to drive a truck? Motherfucker, I just, brought, I just bought new fuel rims. Just had a lift, just had a leveling kit put in. Just, I just paid ahead of my Sirius XM subscription. Uh, no, no, I'm out. Hey, 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 motherfucker, I'll cut your hands off if you try to take my 4K flat screen. All right, get out of here, Ted. Thought you were cool for a second, psycho. Yeah, no one's getting rid of technology. Sorry, Ted, it is beyond here to stay. Uh, later, Ted writes, in modern industrial society, only minimal effort is necessary to satisfy one's physical needs. It is enough to go through a training program to acquire some petty technical skill, then come to work on time and exert the very modest effort needed to hold a job. The only requirements are a moderate amount of intelligence and most of all, simple, all caps, obedience. If one has those, society takes care of one from c cradle to grave. Obedience! Ted does not like obedience. He does not like feeling that he has to be obedient to the man or anybody. Of course he doesn't. Right, he was strapped to a chair, psychologically tortured in college. You know, and then he continues to ramble on and on and on in his manifesto, David Icke style, you know, uh, talking about leftists a lot. Leftism is a totalitarian force. Leftists hate America. They hate everything successful. They hate white men. Uh, then he attacks conservatives. He thinks conservatives are fools to ignore the influence of technology and accomplishing leftist goals. 
uh, says that technology has separated man from nature, et cetera. A lot, of, a lot of rambling thoughts go on and on and on. And honestly, he does make some good points throughout his ramblings. Uh, many of us probably are too disconnected from nature. Uh, the extreme left is intolerant towards ideas and values that are not their own. So is the extreme right. But Ted never offers in all 35,000 words, uh, you know, what it, what it would take to, you know, uh, resolve everything. He never offers a solution. How are we supposed to get rid of technology and live happily? How exactly does that happen? Uh, how will it make life better? He doesn't know. He just hates being controlled, hates being obedient. Clearly pushed back from that study. He wants to be left alone. He's happy in nature. He thinks a natural life like kids would be better for everybody. And how does one accomplish that? How does one, uh, you know, create this life for everybody? By, by launching a violent revolution against technology. This seems to be the basic motivation for his actions throughout the rest of this timeline. And, and before we jump back into this timeline, a quick word from one of today's sponsors. Today's time is brought to you by Mr. Chuck's Funeral Fun House. No one, no one knows how to put the fun in funeral like the fine folks at Mr. Chuck's Funeral Fun House. Uh, they offer a variety of entertainment packages that can turn a grave dig into a shindig. You can purchase the basic package. The basic package includes a casket with some built-in hydraulics that literally raise your guest of honor up from the dead. A trained operator will stand up your strapped-in loved one, have them tear up the dance floor in death like they never could in life. Uh, each casket also comes with subwoofers, a disco ball, and built-in laser light show. Uh, or you can purchase the premium package. The premium package includes everything from the basic package, plus a firework live cremation service where you can watch your loved one get turned into a human sparkler. You can watch commercial grade fireworks sewn in beforehand by a Mr. Chuck certified mortician slash explosive expert shoot out into the sky. The guest of honor gets burned into an urn as the show winds down. Convenient. And Mr. Chuck is offering time suckers 50% off their deluxe catapult package. A giant catapult will be brought to the funeral location of your choice by the fine folks at Mr. Chuck's Funeral Fun House. You can launch your loved one through the air, let them soar like never before, and win cash and prizes while you do so. Why grieve when you can heave? If the body makes it at least 50 feet through the air, $10 worth of Mama Ridgeway's clean wean soap for everyone. At least 100 feet, one year subscription to Pooty and Juju. Put it in your lunchbox, Shirley! Launch him! Launch him, Pooty! Aim him, Pooty! Fire him, Pooty! At least 150 feet, free two-year enrollment to Chikatilo Wrestling Academy. And if you can hit a, a burning funeral pyre 200 feet out, everyone wins a new car! <laughs> yeah! Load the Kevin! Aim the Kevin! Fire the Kevin! So send your loved ones out in style. Hire Mr. Chuck's Funeral Fun House. Let them know you care by launching those motherfuckers through the air. Every deluxe catapult package comes with two practice cadavers stolen from local nursing homes. You can only have two practice attempts. After that, you have to launch the body at the funeral only one time. No extra practice shots are allowed. And that, of course, is not today's sponsor. But it'd be fun if it was. Where's that parallel dimension? Uh, today's time is brought to you by Ozzy Confidential. What does punk rock have to do with steroid abuse? How does a soap company save a suicide? Ozzy Confidential, the newest podcast from Ozzy tells all. Host Eugene S. Robinson, journalist, actor, stuntman, frontman, creator of Sex with Eugene, True Stories, and Eugenius is now all up in your ear holes with interviews from the underground. Ungoogleable, untold, undiscovered until now. Part ranterific crosstalk from the edge, part no holds barred delving into the dark stuff that's often led left unsaid. Complete with a soundtrack to die for, Ozzy Confidential is a podcast for people, personalities, and weirdly wild notions about what we reveal and what we most want to conceal. Episodes can be 20 minutes. They can be two hours long. You never know. Whatever is best for that episode. On Ozzy Confidential, the form fits the function. So listen up for Ozzy Confidential available everywhere audio lives. And if you just can't wait, listen a day early only on Himalaya. You can download the Himalaya podcast app. This is the podcast your mother warned you about only from Ozzy. Live curiously. Now let's get back to 1978. The year Ted escalates from saboteur to, to, to terrorist. Load the Ted. Aim the Ted. Fire the Ted. Uh, in the spring of 1978, Ted heads back home to visit his family. Also drops off his first bomb. I feel like the bomb part is the primary motivation for this visit. 
Uh, he doesn't feel like his acts of local Montana environmental ecoterrorism are enough, right? He's got to attack the sources of technology and industry. His first bomb targets Buckley Christ, a mechanical engineering professor at Northwestern University. Someone teaching young minds to do the most horrible, disgusting, vile things imaginable. Stuff like how to build medical devices and useful industrial products. Ugh. On May 25th, 1978, Kaczynski drops a package off containing his homemade bomb in a parking lot at the University of Chicago. Someone found the package, delivered it to Chris on the 26th. Chris noticed the package was marked return to sender as if he had sent this package out. Got a little suspicious. Not sure why Ted labeled it that way. Like, uh, like Chris would, would send a bomb to himself. Uh, so, you know, he, he knew he didn't send this package in the first place. Suspicious. Calls campus security. Security officer Terry Marker opens the box. When he does, the bomb explodes. Luckily, not a very big explosion. Left him with only a minor wound on his left hand. The primary component of this first bomb was a, was a length of metal pipe, or was a length, excuse me, a length of metal pipe, about one inch in diameter, about nine inches long, containing smokeless explosive powder, containing a box, the box and the plug sealing the pipe's ends were handcrafted from wood. Most pipe bombs use threaded metal ends. The wooden ends lacked the strength for significant pressure to build up within the pipe, which is what greatly weakened the blast. Uh, the trigger bomb's trigger, or the bomb's trigger, was a, was a nail tensioned by rubber bands, which would strike six common match heads when the box was opened. The match heads would ignite and initiate combustion of the powder. Uh, Kaczynski would later use batteries and heat filament wire to ignite the powder more effectively. Uh, maybe if Kaczynski himself had a mechanical uh, engineering degree, his first bomb would have been more powerful. Luckily, it wasn't. Uh, after this first bombing, Ted briefly worked with his younger brother and father at a foam factory back in Illinois. Foam cutting engineers in Addison, Illinois. Weird job for a, uh, you know, recent PhD, recent Berkeley professor. I just picture uh, him not quite fitting in with the other guys at the foam factory. Hey, Jimmy, where, where'd you work before you came over here? Ah, it's loud and freight at the uh, railway transfer station. <laughs> uh, that's a good job. What about you, Tony? Ah, uh, I was bouncing for a while at the Green Mill. Yeah, ah, I love that place. My my cousin, cousin Sheila, used to date a bartender there named Vincent. Ha! <laughs> uh, what about you, Ted? I taught mathematical theory at Berkeley for a short time. Then I shoveled snow and split firewood in Lincoln, Montana, to live as a survivalist. I also helped uh, Mr. Livingston replace the gate on her fence. Uh, his fence, excuse me, uh, when I wasn't uh, writing a manifesto on how to start the upcoming techno-industrial paradigm subversion. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Anyway, hey, uh, okay, guys, this guy, you know, what the fuck? How does this guy fit in here? Uh, well, back in Chicago, Ted has the only romantic experience of his life that I know of. And by romantic experience, I mean he went on two very unromantic dates with a woman named Ellen Tarmichael, who was a supervisor at the factory, uh, based on interviews she would give years later, it does not sound like they hooked up at all. Sounds like she was bored out of her mind, didn't have a good time, never wanted to go on another date with Ted ever again. Uh, she said that they had dinner at a, at a suburban restaurant for the first date. Uh, two weeks after that, which is not a good sign already, two weeks after that first date, you know, probably not a good sign. They went, they went out to pick apples and, uh, and then went to his parents' house where they baked an apple pie. And uh, then she said, it was on that occasion that I informed Ted that I did not wish to see him further on a social basis uh, because I felt we did not have much in common besides our employment. It feels like she maybe just been kind of like pressured, like it was a guy at work. It's like, okay, doesn't sound like she even really wanted to go on this second date. Uh, I bet she didn't, man. She, she probably wanted to talk about like movies and music and like normal shit. He wanted to talk about destroying America's techno-industrial system. God, I wish I could get like see camera footage of, you know, their date. Do you see Grease yet, Ted? Oh, so good. So fun. Oh, Travolta was amazing. Like, he's such a good dancer in addition to being a good actor. You know, Ted's all, uh, no, I have not seen Grease, nor do I intend to. Ellen, the only Grease I am interested in is the kind a man may use to repair a horse-drawn wagon or perhaps place in between two hand-hewn logs. He is stacked one atop the other without assistance in the remote wilderness of Montana. Ellen... Viewing a motion picture requires financially supporting the techno uh, complex required to film it, which leads to increased material production, which leads to factory construction, which leads to a disintegration of the human psyche and further dependence on urban living, which will lead to further separation from nature, which if taken further... Uh, Ellen, why are you putting on your jacket? Ellen, the, uh, the pie is not finished baking yet. Uh, please, Ellen, uh, we picked this from naturally occurring orchard. Uh, why? Why are you doing this? Uh, Ted does not handle Ellen's rejection very well at all. 
the dude it was he's fucking crazy. Uh, he writes <laughs> what was uh, called demeaning, offensive limericks about her. Two dates. He doesn't want to see him anymore, so he decides to write some demeaning, offensive lyrics and post them up from what it sounded like in like the break room at work. <laughs> like these limericks are cited in interviews later uh, with both David, uh, his brother David, and then Ellen. Sadly, neither say what was written in these limericks. And then, you know, because he posts them at work, his brother David, who, who's actually, uh, you know, another supervisor at this factory, the guy who gave uh, Ted the job, has to fire his brother for what he's done, which is so fucking awkward. Uh, hey, hey, Ted, uh, we got we to gotta have a talk for a minute, buddy. What's going on, David? Is it about the bomb? Uh, what? Did you, did you say bomb? Bomb. Uh, no. I, I said, mom, is it about the mom? Uh, what? No. What's, what's going on with mom? Nothing that I know of, David. Do you know of something going on with mom? Uh, oh, anyway, okay. Let's forget about it. Hey, Ted, it's about Ellen. It's about the limericks, Ted. We need to talk about the limericks, the ones I posted in the break room. Yes, Ted, those limericks. Uh, she, she's very upset. What did she not like? Did she not like the first one that went, we all know a woman named Ellen. She has a pair of C-cup chest melons. She won't let me touch them or even just suck them, so I'll make more bombs like a felon. Is that the one, David, that she did not care for? Or was it this other one? I bet Ellen has a nice-smelling vagina. I bet it is tighter than a finger trap from China. I want to put my penis inside her like a cowboy to ride her, but I hear she is now fucking Tony from the loading dock who is not nearly as good at math as me and could never build his own cabin. So I'm going to try and bomb so many people to teach her a lesson and not even care about her vagina or breasts or hair that smell like lavender ever again unless I am alone and masturbating in the Montana wilderness. Is that the one, David? I admit it may still need some editing work. The end is a bit rough. After all, it is just a rough draft. <laughs> God, I wish I could find those limericks. May 9th, 1979, John Harris becomes the second victim of an attack linked to the Unabomber. Uh, Harris would go on to become a University of Illinois professor. Uh, he was a graduate student at Northwestern University working in the school's technological institute at the time. He said, there was a cigar box on the table outside my office. I picked it up, intending to put some pens and pencils inside. It turned out to be a bomb which did not explode. It had a detonator that went off. I saw a bright flash. I don't remember hearing anything. Uh, luckily this bomb, uh, wasn't built that well either. Harris was treated at a hospital. He only suffered superficial burns. No one else was hurt. Uh, then on November 15th, 1979, Ted goes way bigger than trying to take out a student. He tries to take down an entire plane, a parcel Ted mailed from Chicago. One he'd snuck on a plane somehow catches fire in a mailbag aboard American Airlines flight 444 from Chicago to Washington, D.C. The package contains a bomb that was constructed to explode inside the cargo hold mid-flight, Luckily, the bomb malfunctions and fails to ignite. It does begin to smoke, though, and the plane has to make an emergency landing. Twelve passengers end up being treated for smoke uh, inhalation. The bomb does not ignite because instead of, an, of explosive powder, it contained barium nitrate, a powder often used to create green smoke and fireworks that required a different detonation temperature. This is the bomb that gets the FBI involved. The FBI investigates, concludes that the bomb, had it successfully gone off, could have, in fact, uh, blown the uh, plane out of the sky. They named the case Unibom. Uh, the FBI creates a Unibom task force in conjunction with the ATF and U.S. Postal Service in 1979 and begins devoting significant time and resources looking into the victims of this failed explosion attempt. The research uh, proves to be useless. No correlation or relationship can be found to connect the victims, preventing any potential suspect from being identified. Uh, why a plane? Fucking technology. Planes pollute the environment. Pla planes, uh... You know, they pollute the precious nature Ted loves so dearly. They bring leftists and conservatives to Montana to build more homes and roads and other, other horrible nature-destroying things. They disturb the peace of being out in the wilderness alone. Uh, despite the bomb malfunction, Ted is not done with United Airlines. On June 10th, 1980, a package bomb injures United Airlines President Percy Wood at his home near Chicago. Wood suffers burns and cuts over much of his body but makes a full recovery. The bomb was rigged inside of a book, Ice Brothers, a book about the crew of a Coast Guard vessel off of Greenland in World War II. Uh, I wonder if Percy ever made a full psychological recovery from that. Like, like, can you imagine opening a book that you get in the mail and a fucking bomb goes off in your face? Hello, PTSD. 
Like, like how are you not a little jumpier and paranoid after that for the rest of your life, right? That, that would have to take at least some of the joy out of opening presents on your birthday or on Christmas morning. Can you imagine after that, like, giving Percy, like, a jack-in-the-box for his birthday? <laughs> gotcha, Percy! Oh, shit! Never seen a man jump uh, over a couch from a seated position before. On October 8, 1981, another Unabomber bomb is found in the business class or in a business classroom at, at the uh, University of Utah in Salt Lake City, but it is safely diffused before it can detonate. Uh, on May 5th, 1982, Janet Smith, a secretary at Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University, opens a package containing a bomb. She suffers severe burns on her hands and shrapnel becomes lodged in parts of her body. Luckily, surgeons are able to remove it. She makes a full physical recovery. The FBI still doesn't have a clue who's doing this. Less than a month later, on June 2nd, 1982, Diogenes uh, Angelakos, an engineering professor at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, Kaczynski's old employer, suffers severe burns and has shrapnel lodged in, hands, uh, in his hands and face. He will also make a full recovery minus the physical and psychological scars. That, that one had to have been personal. In 1983, uh, Ted, if he wasn't already fully committed to his insane revolution, becomes so now. Someone started building a road through one of his favorite hiking spots back near his uh, Montana cabin. The world he'd left behind is now headed back towards him. Uh, he didn't move to a cabin, you know, where he had to read by candlelight to hear some goddamn car rumble by. He came there to be left alone and try and grow a beard big enough to have its own ecosystem. A beard where a few families of birds, several chipmunks, some squirrels, some moths and ants, maybe a small deer and shit could coexist together in harmony and peace. Uh, a beard where a smaller mountain man. Could, uh, could find some land inside of it and build his own cabin. And then that little mountain man could grow his own beard that would fit an even tinier mountain man to build his cabin. He moved to Montana so he could create a strange, surreal Russian doll bearded mountain man situation. He moved there so he could walk around naked in the woods and beat off any boners, uh, you know, uh, wherever he felt like, you know. So if they, if they interrupted his, his hike or thoughts of equations. No, but Ted was hiking to his favorite quiet spot. Then he saw a new road that had been carved. He described this moment later saying, it's kind of rolling country, not flat. And when you get to the edge of it, you find these ravines that cut very steeply into cliff-like drop-offs. And there was even a waterfall there. It was about a two days hike from my cabin. That was the best spot until the summer of 1983. That summer, there were too many people around my cabin. So I decided I needed some peace. I went back to the plateau. And when I got there, I found that they had put a road right through the middle of it. You just can't imagine how upset I was. It was from that point on I decided that rather than trying to acquire, uh, acquire further wilderness skills, I would work on getting back at the system. Revenge. This is when he really starts to begin work on his manifesto, like properly, right? He's, he's already been doing shit clearly, but now his idea is really, really starting to crystallize. He really is wanting to kick this revolution off. When describing his new objectives later, he stated, as I see it, I don't think there is any controlled or planned way in which we can dismantle the industrial system. I think the only way we will rid of it is if it breaks down and collapses. The big problem is that people don't believe a revolution is possible, and it is not possible precisely because they do not believe it is possible. To a large extent, I think the eco-anarchist movement is accomplishing a great deal, but I think they could do it better. The real revolutionaries can separate themselves from the reformers. And I think that it would be good if a conscious effort was being made to get as many people as possible introduced to the wilderness. In a general way, I think what has to be done is not to try and convince or persuade the majority of people that we are right, as much as try to increase tensions in society to the point where things start to break down, to create a situation where people get uncomfortable enough that they're going to rebel. So the question is how to increase those tensions. Bombs, motherfucker! That's clearly the subtext. That's why, you know, he wanted to start bombing stuff. Wanted to uh, get that tension going. Just, you know, disrupt society, cause things to melt down. I do find it interesting that he's been having these thoughts, you know, for years now. And he finally just puts this together in 83. Uh, he's furious with academia. Furious with industrialists. Uh, May 15th, 1985, the first permanent injuries suffered by one of Kaczynski's victims occur when John Hauser, a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, loses all four fingers on one of his hands, sustains a severed artery in his right arm and suffers permanent partial vision loss in both of his eyes. Hey, good job, Ted. Way to fuck up a talented Berkeley grad student. You're, you really did something great for the environment there. Um, John had dreamed, by the way, of being an Air Force fighter pilot uh, and possibly working one day as an astronaut. Ted, uh, he ruined those dreams. His bombs, uh, or his bomb, blew those dreams just to shit. Uh, luckily, Hauser was able to create a new dream for himself, new life for himself. He'd go on to become an accomplished researcher 
and professor of electrical engineering at the University of Colorado. But an interview said, you know, he still gets, uh, obviously, you know, very angry about Ted Kaczynski when he looks at his hand and he thinks about, you know, uh, his, uh, the dreams he once had when he hears a plane fly overhead and thinks about, like, how he used to want to be up there doing that. On June 13th, a package bomb is discovered and disarmed at Boeing in Auburn, Washington. November 15th, 1985, psychology professor James McConnell, his assistant Nicholas Sweeno, are injured by a bomb addressed to McConnell at Ted's alma mater, the University of Michigan. Uh, Professor McConnell seems to have embodied everything Ted detested. He was rich, flamboyant, irreverent, controversial. His success came from behavior modification, research and theories, you know, and we know how Ted feels about, uh, you know, behavior modification research. McConnell believed that people could be molded simply by deciding what they should be and then manipulating their behavior. Obedience! McConnell is helping the techno-industrial system create obedient little worker bees. You must pay the price. Uh, McConnell's work originated from research with flatworms. This is so weird. After training some half-inch long worms to navigate a simple maze, McConnell then ground up the trained worms, fed them to untrained worms, finding that they were then able to negotiate the maze better than a control group. I know that sounds like one of my lies, but apparently he really did this. Uh, I don't, no part of me understands. I didn't know that A, worms could eat other worms, and B, worms could get smarter by eating other worms. And now... A little part of me worries that maybe we have a race of worm people living underground. Maybe they may get smarter for centuries, just eating people's brains in cemeteries. I'm pretty sure that's impossible, but might not be a bad idea to keep your eye out for smart worm people, especially if you live near a cemetery where a lot of smart people have been buried. Like, I don't feel like uh, people living in my hometown of Riggins have as much to worry about as people living in like a college town, <laughs> right? Probably a little bit lower quality worm people. You get back in the dirt, cooter, wor- cooter worm dummy. Get back in the dirt, worm cretin. You get back in your wormhole, you damn hillbilly worm fella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. McConnell was outspoken, popular. He was teaching at Kaczynski's old school. No evidence that he and Kaczynski ever crossed paths, but Ted would have known about him. 1964, McConnell was featured in a Saturday Evening Post article about his work, suggested that someday humans might be able to learn the piano by taking a pill or to, uh, to take calculus by injection. Two months later, McConnell even took his celebrated flatworms on the Steve Allen show. And then more fame and fortune came in the 1970s with publication of McConnell's uh, popular textbook, Understanding Human Behavior, sold over a million copies, used on more than 700 campuses. A 1982 People Magazine article pointed out that McConnell's royalties of $250,000 a year provided him with a $40,000 Mercedes, 1,000 bottle wine cellar, and a new million-dollar house. And then the Unabomber's package arrived at that house just outside Ann Arbor, on November 15th, 1985, taped to the top was a one-page letter with a Salt Lake City postmark. said, I'd like you to read this book. Everybody in your position should read this book. McConnell asked his assistant, Nicholas Sweeno, to open it. And when Sweeno started uh, wrestling with it on the kitchen counter, it exploded. The blast blew a six-inch hole in the kitchen counter, and Sweeno suffered shrapnel wounds and powder burns on his arms and legs. McConnell suffered a slight hearing loss. But the bombing shook him deeply psychologically, as, pointed, as he pointed out later in a letter provided by a friend and co-author, Daniel Gornflow. McConnell, who died in 1990, wrote, I just wandered around the house, scarred, angry, and frustrated. The FBI continues to search in vain for the Unabomber. On December 11th, 1985, the Unabomber kills for the first time. One of his bombs takes the life of Hugh Scrutton in a parking lot near a Sacramento computer store. A bomb that looked like a piece of debris killed him when he picked it up outside the back door of a Sacramento computer rental store. It was a crude device filled with tiny pieces of nails to maximize its damage. Uh, Scruton had Berkeley connections. He was a summer math student in 1967. Summer loved the year Kaczynski started teaching there. Here's how the government sentencing memorandum for Ted's later federal trial would describe Hugh. Friends recall Hugh as a man who embraced life, a gentleman with a sense of humor who had traveled around the world, climbed mountains, and studied languages. He cared about politics, was fair and kind in business, and was remembered as straightforward, honest, and sincere. He left behind his mother, sister, family members, a girlfriend who loved him dearly, and a circle of friends and colleagues who respected and cared for him. And here's how Ted would describe Hugh's death when he wrote about it in his Montana fucking maniac shed. Experiment 97, December 11th, 1985. I planted a bomb disguised to look like a scrap of lumber behind Rentec Computer Store in Sacramento. According to the San Francisco Examiner, December 20th, the operator of the store was killed, blown to bits on December 12th. Excellent. Humane way to eliminate somebody. He probably never felt a thing. $25,000 reward offered. Rather flattering. 
Man, just no remorse. All part of Ted's crazy plan to bring down the techno-industrial system. And, and Hugh's death, not painless, by the way. The first person to arrive at the scene of the explosion said they heard Hugh cry out to them, Oh my God, help me. So he did suffer. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, February 20th, 1987, a bomb injures Gary Wright near his Salt Lake City computer shop. Uh, the blast sends him flying through the air. More than 200 pieces of shrapnel tear into his body. Some shards sever nerves in his left arm. Same kind of bomb Ted used on Hugh Scrutton. Disguised as a piece of wood someone left in the parking lot. Wright would survive, and at least as recent as 2008, he was still living in Utah, working as a technical sales engineer in the biopharmaceutical and medical device industries. He also went on to become close friends with Ted's brother, David, after Ted was caught. Uh, the two meet up a few times a year, and David now considers Gary more of a brother than Ted. I wonder how Ted feels about that as he sits in prison. Can you imagine? You try to kill somebody. They survive. You go to prison, and then your family be befriends that person and, and uh, chooses their friendship over, over your relation, the relationship with you. It's got a sting. And, and, of course, Ted deserves all of that and more for what he did. Just, uh, just kind of unusual. Uh, the attack on Gary also led to the now infamous Unabomber sketch. That's that sketch, you know, the dude with the little mustache. He's got his aviator sunglasses, hooded sweatshirt. A woman reported seeing a man dressed like that in the parking lot outside of Wright's computer store moments before the bomb exploded. Uh, unfortunately, the famous sketch would never lead the FBI and the Unabomb task force, that FBI collaboration with the ATF and U.S. Postal Service, any closer to catching Ted. And then the bombing stopped for over six years. Ted's never given a good reason why. Uh, it seems like he mostly just focused on killing his neighbor, uh, Chris Waite's dogs during this period. Remember, we talked about that. We mentioned it twice now already. Um, but here's a little more detail. Chris said that one day in July of 1987, when he arrived home from working in the woods, and remember, this is that next door neighbor, yeah. Uh, his wife, Betty, told him the dogs had crossed the gulch toward Ted's property, then came home, this is so bizarre, covered in human shit. Human shit was smeared into their coats. Smeared more deeply than if the animals had just rolled around in some shit they found. Ted never confessed to doing this, but when you hear the rest of these dog tales, it becomes pretty safe to assume he did it. Uh, 1988, Chris and Betty take a short trip to Helena, Montana, do some shopping. When they get back home, they find one of their two-year-old Malamutes lying in the yard paralyzed. The dog soon died. The vet determined he'd been a victim of poisoning. Later in 1988, Chris and Betty uh, bought a breeding pair of Sharpays, and the first litter of puppies arrived the following summer. The dogs are well aware of Ted's habits and places nearby he frequented, especially some trail uh, above an old miner's ditch where Ted would cross into the gulch. Chris said it wasn't long before the dogs had worn a trail resembling a cow path on the hillside just from running back and forth between their house and the old ditch and then along the ditch sniffing for Ted. Chris wrote that he felt kind of bad that dogs, the dogs would interrupt uh, Ted's solitude, but, you know, what are you going to do? You know, if Ted really wanted to keep his dogs out, he should have built a fucking fence, build a privacy fence. Uh, you're a smart guy, right? You know how to make a bomb. You probably know how to make a fucking fence. Uh, the dogs Chris had, uh, had had at the house, they were there to protect Betty when uh, he wasn't home and also protect their, their home from being vandalized or robbed because that had happened to many of their neighbors. And in the late 80s, the Waits family dogs continued to be targets of mean-spirited acts. Quite often, one or more of them would limp home with cuts or deep bruises. Uh, Bo Jangles just told me that the Unabomber jumped to the top uh, three on his list of most despicable su subjects. Uh, the next two dogs to meet their demise were both Sharpays. Ted poisoned them both. Then Ted shot their Malamute. And this is all speculation, but I, again, I really think he did this. Because then, then during the early 90s, they lose four more dogs, all poisoned. Um, why do I think Ted did this? Uh, because after he finally got arrested in 1996, or 1996, excuse me, the attack stopped completely. To me, maybe more than anything else, this proves that the Unabomber was not some kind of revolutionary. He was just, he was just a hateful, antisocial fucking asshole. Right? He's such a hateful piece of shit that he doesn't have anybody around him bothering him, but some dogs bark, and then he has to kill them. Gee, boo-hoo, Ted. Uh, the people at Harvard were so mean to you, you fucking crybaby. You should have hated yourself for being too goddamn weak to stand up for yourself and opt out of that experiment. You fucking baby. But you didn't. You know, you could have quit. You were never a revolutionary. You were just the dumbest fucking genius ever. Uh, you could crack math equations, but you couldn't crack forming and maintaining normal human relationships. And instead of taking responsibility for that, instead of realizing the problem was you, not everybody else, you know, you just, you just sat around in your little cabin and you got bitter, just stewing in your angry thoughts. And instead of trying to fix yourself, you just lash out at everybody else. That's always convenient. It's always easy. You know, you even lowered yourself to lash out at their pets. 
Man, I hope prison life is just making you miserable. I hope the guards are fucking with you like those people at Harvard did. You deserve it. And I know how much you hate to be obedient. You hate being caged. Well, now you have to be obedient. You have to be in a cage. Oh, it's poetic. Uh, on June 22nd, 1993, the Unabomber strikes again, injures Charles Epstein, the University of California at San Francisco, geneticist. Uh, Ted hated geneticists. He, he would later warn in his manifesto about advances to genetics, which he argued would lead to genetic engineering that would be used to take away people's free will. Kaczynski believed that eugenics would lead to a society where people are manufactured and like cars are built based on the wants and needs of society. He felt his focus on genetics would result in the, in the essence of humans dying. Dr. Epstein opened a padded brown envelope that had come in the mail. The envelope exploded, destroying three of his fingers, breaking his arm, burning his hand, face, and abdomen. Excuse me. He later said that if the package had been pointed in a slightly different direction, the bomb would have killed him. Epstein had recently been the subject of a New York Times article he'd been written about fairly frequently. He was one of the most prominent geneticists of the 1970s. Uh, this article brought Epstein to Ted's attention. Uh, Epstein was mostly known for pioneering work in the study of Down syndrome. Not sure how that made him an evil symbol. Uh, excuse me. Epstein hypothesized in the early 1970s that the extra chromosome would produce multiple copies of certain proteins, which would produce physical characteristics of the syndrome, a thesis that many researchers initially derided, but then was proven correct. Uh, the Unabomber then taunted Dr. Epstein after the attack in another letter for not being smart enough to know better than to open a package from someone he did not know. He just enjoys this. Uh, Epstein was also a graduate of Harvard. Uh, he got his bachelor's in chemistry there in 1955, got his first medical degree, uh, or got his medical degree there in 1959, so he was really on Ted's shit list. And then just two days later, David uh, Galerntner, 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 Yale University computer scientist would become the Unabomber's next victim. Early in the morning of June 24th, 1993, Galerntner, uh, Galerntner, I don't like it, Galerntner, settled in his fifth floor office in Arthur K. Watson Hall at the base of Science Hill. Having just returned from a vacation in Washington, D.C., uh, Galerntner found a stack of mail, including a package, a Ph.D. dissertation, he assumed, sitting on his chair. Ripping open the package, smoke billowed out, and then there was a flash. Uh, Galerntur headed to a nearby bathroom to wash his eye out before discovering a more pressing concern. He was bleeding profusely from many different parts of his body. Rather than wait for help to arrive, he hobbled down five flights of stairs. Uh, he recalled in a 1977 book on the attack, thinking uh, at that point, I'm in pain and royally annoyed. Headed across Hill House Avenue to University Health Services. Uh, had he waited, he likely would have bled to death, doctors told him there. When he arrived at the clinic, uh, Galerntur had a blood pressure uh, reading of zero. FBI agents later found one of his shoes in his office where shrapnel sliced through metal filing cabinets, found his bloodied shirt thrown onto the staircase. Uh, the bomb had severely wounded his abdomen, chest, face, and hand. Galerntur would never recover the use of his right hand. Why was he targeted? He was also featured in a recent New York Times article, and he was a technological innovator. How dare he make computer advancements? Uh, Galerntor is a pioneer in the field of parallel computation, a type of computing in which many calculations are carried out simultaneously. Uh, the programming language he developed in the 1980s, a language called Linda, made it possible to link together several small computers into a supercomputer, significantly increasing the amount and complexity of data that computers can process. Uh, a year and a half later, December 10th, 1994, 50-year-old advertising executive Thomas Mosser becomes the next Unabomber fatality. Mosser was a Navy vet who served in Vietnam. Just nine days earlier, Mosser had received a huge promotion, becoming the general manager of Young and Rubicam, giant worldwide advertising and communications company based in New York. Clients include Philip Morris, the second largest advertiser in the nation at the time. Uh, he lived in a hilly cul-de-sac in North Caldwell, New Jersey, with his wife, Susan, his daughters, Kim, 13, and Kelly, 15 months. Uh, he also had two other adult children from a previous marriage. After the explosion... Uh, neighbors said it was incredibly lucky that a bunch of other people, most of them children, didn't also die, uh, weren't killed by the bomb. A neighbor had thrown a party the night before Mosser opened his package bomb. Several children had wandered over from the party to the Mosser's house at one point, and the bomb that his wife had signed for but not opened was just sitting on the dining room table with about a half dozen kids sitting around it at one point. Uh, Thomas was killed instantly. When he opened the package at 11 a.m. on Saturday morning, the blast blew out all the windows of the dining room as well. Ted had figured out how to make a really powerful bomb by now. Ted Kaczynski would later write a letter to the New York Times saying he blew up Thomas Mosser because Thomas helped Exxon clean up its public image after the Exxon Valdez or Valdez 
oil spill environmental disaster. And more importantly, because his business is the development of techniques for manipulating people's attitudes. Obedience. Thomas was pushing obedience in the system. He was an ad exec and all marketers deserve to die. That's what Ted's thinking. On April 24th, 1995, California Forestry Association President Gilbert P. Murray becomes the third and final fatality of a Unabomber explosion and the first who was not the intended target. Uh, the package the Unabomber had sent was addressed to William N. Dennison, the man who served as president and chief executive officer of the Calif chief executive officer of the California Forestry Association from 1980 to 1994. This is a man who is a highly visible figure in a number of contentious environmental issues. Mr. Dennison was a key player for the timber industry who fought against environmentalists on behalf of loggers. He wanted to open up more land, specifically in the Northwest, to be logged. And that didn't sit well with Ted. Gilbert P. Murray was Dennison's replacement. And 52-year-old Ted didn't bother doing his homework to find out uh, that fact before sending out a lethal package bomb. The explosion in the association's reception area knocked doors off their hinges, blew out ceiling tiles, shattered glass partitions inside the 7,500-square-foot office. Five other employees who were present at the time of the blast escaped unharmed. Uh, and then in June of 1995, the Unabomber sends out that 35,000-word manifesto to the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, the one they initially do not publish. Then on June 28, 1995, Ted, Ted sends a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle threatening an attack on a flight out of Los Angeles. It says, warning, the terrorist group FC called Unabomber by the FBI is planning to blow up an airliner out of Los Angeles International Airport sometime during the next six days. To prove that the writer of this letter knows something about FC, the first two digits of their identifying number are 5-5. Five, five. The next day, a letter arrives in the New York Times saying that his uh, threat was a prank, saying, uh, since the public has a short memory, we decided to play one last prank to remind them who we are. But no, we haven't tried to plant a bomb on an airline recently. So he's just, you know, he's just an anarchist, just sending out weird shit. Three months later, on September 19th, 1995, the Washington Post, New York Times, do publish that Unabomber manifesto, and it leads directly to his arrest. Uh, what's insane to me is that when the manifesto is published, it's widely praised by academics, journalists, and intellectuals. It was described as logical, thoughtful, convincing, and artfully written. Uh, most readers do not doubt Ted's sanity or intelligence. And this praise will bring us uh, into today's unique idiots of the internet right after a word from today's final sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you by longtime supporter, champion of knowledge, favorite of Nimrod, The Great Courses Plus. I know you take a lot of joy in learning as much as you can about the world as I do. That's why I want you to check out The Great Courses Plus. Uh, this online learning service gives you unlimited access to thousands of video and audio lectures. Learn about virtually anything from fascinating, engaging experts who are so passionate about their subjects, uh, like history, science, psychology, literature, even martial arts. Ah, oh, man, I, I, I gotta learn some of that. Photography. Uh, I've been enjoying some uh, some great new mini lectures they have. Right, you can sneak these in while you're while you're waiting for your chronically late friend to meet you, uh, or maybe even during a bathroom break at work. Seven to ten minutes long. Uh, it's it's the this day in history lectures. Uh, they have they have ones on Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, uh, Nelson Mandela being freed from prison. Raising the flag on Iwo Jima on February 23rd, 1945, and more. I want you to start enjoying the Great Courses Plus with this exclusive limited time offer. Get two months. Two months of unlimited learning for just 99 cents. That's, that's total access to enjoy their huge library of engaging lectures for two full months for under a dollar. That's the best deal I've heard. Uh, but to get this exclusive offer, you must sign up within the next few weeks at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Time suck. Do it. It's worth it. The special offer to get two full months for just 99 cents is only available for a limited time, only at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash time suck. So sign up now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash time suck. Link in the episode description. Sponsor leak button on the time suck app, which just got updated. Lots of new fixes. Uh, now, now time for today's Idiots of the Internet. <laughs> Of the internet. Internet. All right, for today's Idiots of the Internet, switching it up a little bit, not going to YouTube. Went over to Amazon uh, and just checked out some of the, re the user reviews of Ted's Manifesto, which you can buy there. You can buy the paperback version of the Unabomber Manifesto for 10 bucks. 
49 customer reviews of this particular dish, 4.4 out of 5 star ratings, right? 4.4 out of 5. That's the rating right now. Uh, customer Alicia gives it 5 out of 5 stars, as, as most do, uh, writing, only extreme liberals and conservatives will not agree with this book. The few objective balanced Americans left in America will agree. However, you must have a good concrete knowledge of human history, culture, psychosocial behavior, and have read dystopian novels to understand. If not, you're screwed. Stay scrolling for the next camp out date at Best Buy for the latest Apple computer you can't pay in cash. People also need to have an understanding of the genius thinking and inability to function socially. If you are a full-grown adult who owns or has owned a home, pays lots of taxes, has children, and pays for the useless crap, saves for their college, not really an education, pays $2,000 for a family medical plan with a deductible of $5,000, you don't sleep, you don't vacation, you barely eat, you can't save for your old age, then you will feel, then you will fully feel and understand this book. Buy it and don't judge what has been said about this man. The media is the antichrist that perpetuates hate and ignorance. <sighs> okay. Uh, I, am, I am sure as hell not an extreme liberal. Maybe I'm conservative. Maybe, maybe that's why it doesn't make sense to me. I'm conservative on some issues like crime, punishment, military, fi most fiscal matters. Super liberal on social issues. Uh, do you have a concrete understanding of human history, Alicia? I don't, I don't think you do. Uh, you're a typical uh, historical revisionist. Most people seem to be. You don't see the past for what it actually was. You see it for what you want to be. And you get swept up in this fucking dystopia and you read, what, George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World. You think that that's inevitable because of technology. Uh, yeah, and, and does it suck to have, uh, have to work lots of hours to still not be able to afford a college education or be able to retire or to own a home or, or, or to have medical insurance for your family? Yeah, it does suck. But way back when, way back before the Industrial Revolution, way back before technology, fucking no one had insurance. You know why, Alicia? Because they didn't have any fucking doctors. They just died all the time. Horrible deaths. Some people having access to modern medicine is still way better than no one having any, any medical knowledge whatsoever. Can we improve things? Yeah, a whole bunch. I hope we do. I think it's very possible. But are things worse because of technology and industry? Fuck no. That is a ridiculous, asinine notion. People uh, didn't worry about saving for retirement in the olden days because most people never, ever retired. They worked until they died or until their family took care of their crippled geriatric ass. People weren't retiring at 45 or 55 or 65 in the olden days and heading off to go on a carnival cruise or to Snowbird in Florida or, or Arizona for the winter. No, they're pioneers living off the land. You know, they didn't get to stop hunting and gardening and damn near freezing to death every winter when they hit 65. No, they still had to work. It was just harder now with their arthritis. They couldn't be fucking treated because there was no doctor. It was just a different kind of work. They weren't working in a factory, but they were still working uh, and arguably possibly harder, right? They still had to split firewood, still had to plant crops, still had to kill and cook their food. But you don't think that's work? Have you ever lived off the land, Alicia? I highly fucking doubt it. I bet you'd have to, uh, I bet you'd be begging to have some technology back if you had to do it for one week. Oh, I bet you'd be crying like a baby. Will people ever stop turning the past into some nonsensical utopian fantasy? Drives me fucking crazy. Uh, user Leah gives it five stars and posts, excellent, an amazing intellectual perspective and forecast of today's society. And again, just strikes me as a weird thing to say. Like, these people realize that just by using Amazon, they're part of the machine that Ted hated, <laughs> right? Ted would never buy this book off of Amazon and then leave a review for other people to read on their technological devices. It's so weird to me, you know, like someone writes a book that, that, that the message is, fuck technology, stay away from it, fuck computers. And then people go on their computer and read it and then type in positive reviews. <laughs> He's right. We don't need computers. What? Uh, user uh, Gioli Gatti gives it five stars and writes, one of the greatest book that I've ever read, which I just find funny because uh, he spelled the color red, not the word that denotes having read something. Kind of kind of just detracts from your literary review clout when you don't spell red correctly. Uh, user Amophilos cracks me up with a four-star rating, writing exactly as advertised, but dot, 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 why the hell did I buy this? Exactly. Uh, you can read the entire thing on the internet for free, by the way. If you're listening to this, you're a big Unabomber fan, don't, or Unabomber fan, you don't have to buy it. There's PDFs of the entire thing, and it's written as, you know, as it was published for free. It's all over the place. Uh, user Richard Zachary writes in a way that makes me think he may have 
one of the most punchable faces on the planet. This pretentious son of a bitch. This is what he writes. Back when Kaczynski's manifesto was thrust rather literally into the limelight, I read the first 60 or 70 of its numbered paragraphs with unalloyed admiration and agreement. Having rambled back to his precincts by way of some obliquely related research, uh, I have just read his Apologia Pro Vita Sua in its entirety, rereading the proportions, or rereading the portions I had perused previously. Notwithstanding the copyright restrictions placed upon its dissemination through Wikipedia, there are no shortage of facsimiles to be found on the internet. Alas, I would have fain purchased his manifesto for the $9 advertised on Amazon.com. Were there any likelihood that some portion of the proceeds would find its way into TK's prison deposit account? The prospect of enriching the likes of David Gl God damn it, this name. Uh, Galertner in Propia Persona, or by way of some hand-picked charity, with a few of my hard-earned shekels, is viscerally unpleasant. TK's manifesto is a sustained uh, Hegelian exercise in diagnostic analysis concerning progressive tendencies in modern societies in which the aboriginal encounter with an untamed wilderness and the establishment of settlements in its midst are but quaint memories preserved in archives or used as fodder for entertainment. The manifesto articulates a progressive line of logic, proceeding from general observations and first principles toward the formulation of a course of action that might arrest, if not reverse, a widespread and worsening malaise that is routinely decried by commentators without a semblance of an impulse to do something about it. Though it may be abysmally unrealistic to undertake to change the world, unless someone has the gumption to take the first step, the waters will continue to heat without disturbing the complacent amphibians in their cover ever comfortable bath. TK was he just fucking goes there. TK was one of those individuals to whom talk is not cheap, nor radicalism of the cosseted and tenured variety that relegates the question of implementation to soapbox posturing or news panel sound bites. Haltingly, with crude materials and fitful illumination as could be gleaned from a hermit's shack beneath the grid of power and prestige, he made a fundamentally accurate diagnosis and undertook to implement a remedy, commencing with stutter steps in the hope that others would follow safely imprisoned in a maximum security prison for the rest of his years, mealy-mouthed careerist swine who prattle about revolutionary commitment like Gibbon expatiating about love have license to roll their eyes at his example. Fuck! Ugh! I do roll my eyes at you, Dicky Z. God! I bet you hang out at, like, fucking poetry nights and just, like, roll your eyes. It's just it's never... Oh, oh, my vocabulary is far superior to what this person... Oh. Oh, you write in the most punchable way. There's no chance you and I get along. I've always hated people who go out of their way to show off just how intelligent they are, you know, with these obscure intellectual references, you know, archaic vocabulary choices. We get it, fuckface. You aced English lit. I imagine Dick Zachary is a pretentious independent bookstore record shop employee, right? Someone with about as many friends as Ted had. Someone perpetually disgusted that their customers don't have the same obscure, eclectic, and clearly sophisticated and superior tastes. You're intelligent academically, but like Ted, you also come, to cross, uh, come across to me as a fucking fool when it comes to pragmatic intelligence. Careerist? Swine? Oh yeah, God forbid anyone try to increase the numbers on their paycheck, provide a better life for their families, and yet you reference your hard-earned shekels like an asshole. Uh, so clearly you work. So what, it's okay to work, but not to get paid past a certain dollar amount? You fucking dumb communist. If you don't want to make money when you work, well, you could probably get Kim Jong-un to take you over to North Korea if you tried hard enough. You know? And you'd rather give to the Unabomber himself than to a charity, you fucking piece of shit. You admire Ted so much? Well, why don't you get off Amazon? Sell your computer. Go build your cabin. Be a well-read lunatic with expansive vocabulary. Eco-terrorist leanings. See how far that gets you. See how many Montana winters you can make it through in a shed with no running water or electricity. Uh, I'm guessing about, I don't know, zero. I'm guessing uh, you and uh, what's her name, Alicia A. would get along great together. Uh, you two could just sit in a coffee shop and just uh, drink some lattes and talk about how you despise the world. Finally, right when I was starting to think uh, I was the crazy one for not understanding Ted's genius, customer past master 2014 crushes it with his comment, giving the manifesto five stars, but leaving the following review. I purchased this book with my 4G smartphone for my smart chair with five massage sheddings, heated and ventilated pockets <laughs> in the comfort of my house set up with smart technology that allows me to dim my light to raise the temperature by using my voice. My son rolls by in his hoverboard while using his Oculus to play a game about hoverboarding. 
My wife is taking a live stream spinning class on her $3,000 bike while talking on her hands-free Bluetooth device to her friend in the class. Our daughter left our Wi-Fi enabled refrigerator door open and it just texted our television to let us know it needs closed. Life is great. Ted, you had it all wrong. Fucking love it. Love the sarcasm, past master. I agree. I love technology. What's that Napoleon, Napoleon Dynamite song? Yes, I love technology. <laughs> or, you know, yes, you love technology, but not as much as me, you see. Always and forever. Always and forever. Time suck. Not possible without it. So thank you, scientists, and fuck you, Ted. Idiots of the Internet. All right. So back to the fall of 1995. The manifesto has been published. The FBI still does not know who Ted is. They've been looking for that stinky, no deodorant using, dirty, bearded, wild-eyed maniac since November of 1979. The FBI hoped that publishing a manifesto would lead someone to recognize the writing style, realize it was someone they knew. They offered a million-dollar reward, started receiving over a 1,000 phone calls a day. Uh, thousands and thousands of suspects are looked at. None of those initial leads go anywhere, but the publication is leading to Ted's arrest. Ted's sister-in-law, Linda Patrick, uh, already suspicious of Ted based on the few times they had interactions over the years, based on what her husband, Ted's brother, David, had told uh, her, um, uh, you know, like uh, like about Ted. Um, then the manifesto was published, and she really becomes suspicious and encourages David to read it after she does. And when he does, he knows it's Ted. Despite becoming more and more strange over the years, David still loved his big brother. He anguished for months over if he should contact authorities or not. Uh, eventually, David and Linda hire an attorney. And then they also hire a private investigator, Susan Swanson, to look into Ted. Swanson ends up presenting her findings to the FBI. Uh, David also gives additional findings to the FBI, gives him, the FBI some letters Ted had sent him over the years. The evidence and the letters given to former FBI hostage negotiator and criminal profiler Clinton, Clinton R. Van, uh, Van Zandt in, the, in early 1996. After looking everything over with an FBI team of analysts, he concludes that there was at least a 60% chance that Ted is the Unabomber. The FBI asked him to look over the results again with a second team. He does so. They are even more certain that Ted is their man. And then on April 3rd, 1996, FBI agents who have obtained a search warrant raid the Unabomber's cabin. They arrest Ted in the doorway of his cabin. The handcuffs they used now reside in the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. The United States Postal Service uh, did play a significant role in investigating Kaczynski's series of mail bombs. Inside the cabin, they find bomb-making materials, a live bomb ready for mailing, the original manifesto manuscript, and 40,000 pages of journals. 40,000 pages of journals! Recording Kaczynski's daily life, his bombing campaign, and his overall anger at society. Uh, days after his arrest, a federal grand jury indicts Kaczynski in, uh, on 10 counts of illegally transporting, mailing, and using bombs, and on three counts of murder. Uh, Kaczynski is put on trial in federal court in Sacramento in late 1997. The government is seeking the death penalty. David and their uh, and uh, him and he and Ted's mother Wanda come to court each day. But Ted, uh, I thought this was such a cruel little detail. Sitting just a few feet away from them, never once acknowledged them. Not ever. Not one time when they came to courtroom. Never like uh, a kind glance. His demeanor in court was po polite, attentive, calm, and cold. Uh, the shaggy hermit. Uh, whose picture had been broadcast around the world, now looked kind of like a mild professor. Uh, a, a, jury, a jury was selected, but the trial never actually started. Uh, Kaczynski got locked in a procedural battle with his lawyers, uh, the prosecutors, and ultimately the judge about his defense. His court-appointed lawyers believed his best chance of avoiding the death penalty was to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. But Kaczynski adamantly did not want to be labeled mentally ill. That was going against his revolution. That would discredit it. He tried to fire his lawyers in favor of a private attorney willing to let him risk execution to present his case. That it was a political argument. Uh, his case would be built around his manifesto. You know, he would just explain why his actions were necessary. Uh, the judge denied the change of counsel. A psychiatric evaluation ordered by the court did diagnose Kaczynski as paranoid schizophrenic. Kaczynski asked to represent himself. The judge denied this. Unable to get what he wanted, which was more attention and publicity for his manifesto, he pleaded guilty rather than to hear himself uh, represented as his at his trial as insane or as insane. On May 4th, 1998, Kaczynski received four life sentences. He later tried to withdraw this plea, arguing it was involuntary. But Judge Garland Ellis Burrell Jr. denied this request and the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit upheld the judge's decision. 
In 2006, Burrell ordered the items from Kaczynski's cabin to be sold at a reasonably advertised internet auction with the proceeds going to the victims of his attacks. The auction raised $232,000. Uh, Kaczynski today is 76 years old and living in a supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. He remains a prolific writer, uh, corresponding in longhand with hundreds and hundreds of people, producing essays and books. Uh, Technological Slavery, a collection of some of his writings, was published in 2010. Currently, it has a four-star rating, a lot of five-star reviews. Tyler Patterson loved it, writing the subject line of the book that points out the cause of all our problems. And then leaving a review of, seriously, my favorite book of all time. While technology claims to be the solution to all of our problems, it is, in fact, the cause of all of our problems. Amazing book. <sighs> okay. And again, leaving that on Amazon. All right. Yeah, you hate technology, but there you are. In a report for the 50th reunion of his class at Harvard in 2012, Kaczynski gave his occupation. He actually responded, uh, wrote down that his occupation was prisoner. And under awards, he listed his four life sentences. Uh, his mother, uh, Wanda, wrote Ted a letter every month before she died in 2011. Uh, despite corresponding from prison with hundreds of strangers, he never responded once to her. His brother, David, still sends Ted letters on holidays, and Ted has yet to respond to him either. And that takes us out of today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So that's Ted, man. Very smart man and a very dumb man. A lot of people seem to be huge fans of his, but in my opinion, uh, everyone I can find online that, that you know acts as if they're a big fan just seem to be fucking phonies. And, and I know that be, because they're online, right? They're not leaving comments like, hey, came to the library to leave this comment real quick. Been in the woods the past two years. Just want everyone to know that Ted was right. Meet me out by Mount Shasta if you want to join the revolution. It's better out here. No. Uh, um, you know, I get thinking that Ted has some good points in his manifesto. I, I, I agree with some of his points. You know, ac actually, another Amazon reviewer did sum up my thoughts about Ted perfectly. Customer Andrew Maynard gave uh, the, his manifesto a one-star review uh, just a few weeks ago with a subject line of narrow-minded and uninformed thinking masquerading as genius. And then he wrote, this is an essay that some people find easy to read selectively cherry picking the passages that confirm their own beliefs and ideas while conveniently ignoring others yet taken as a whole Kaczynski's manifesto is a poorly informed rant against what he refers to pejoratively as leftists and a naive justification for reverting to a more primitive society where individuals had what he believed was more agency over how they lived even if this meant living in poverty and disease exactly Andrew exactly uh, sure he makes some good points not good to only live on your phone. Not good to have your face in your phone all the time. Not good to lose touch with nature. However, technology is also fucking awesome. Like, if you really think he was totally right, why are you listening to this podcast, right? Smash your phone. Destroy your computer. You know, start saving up some cabin money. Do it. F find some cheap land. You can still find cheap land out in the country if you don't care where it is, as long as it's just remote. If you're like, well, I can't do it anymore because land's too expensive. No, it's not. I, I just looked quickly. Uh, late last night before recording this, I looked up a, you know, a land listing just around where I live. I found a listing for 1.5 acres near Sandpoint, Idaho, about an hour north of Suck Dungeon. This, this is land on the water, right? Not on the lake, but on a little river, listed for $19,000. I bet you could probably get it for $15,000 if you pay cash, right? There's all kinds of land up for auction as well uh, around, around where I live. You know, if you could get your hands on five, ten grand cash, you could buy in the right spot a couple acres outright. Own it out. You, you could pay next to nothing in property taxes each year. You could build a shack out of old tires and fucking wood scraps and dead raccoons. You could get an axe, a hunting rival, some bullets, maybe some cornmeal, some flour, sack of sugar, some cast iron cookware. Maybe, maybe watch a YouTube video before you take off about how to build a teepee. Maybe just live in a tent. Bring a bunch of blankets out there. Make sure to keep the campfire burning all winter long. Just, just fucking get after it. Go live that survivalist life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hot folk, dark folk. Bye-bye, TV. Bye-bye, computers. Adios, phones. Say goodbye to gas-powered generators. Anything that runs on batteries, etc. No doctors. No dentists either. Don't cheat. They use technology to cure people. You're better than that. Right? Figure out which, uh, you know, which leaves to boil. Uh, what to drink if you get a sinus infection. Figure out what berries to chew on when you get dangerously dehydrated from violent diarrhea. Figure out what type of mud is best to, to rub on a broken bone. And if that doesn't sound good, well, maybe you're not such a big fan of Ted after all. Maybe you're fucking kidding yourself. I'm not a big fan. Do not care for the guy. Glad he's in prison. 
Time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Ted Kaczynski was born in Chicago in 1942, went on to graduate from Harvard, get his doctorate at the University of Michigan, become the youngest associate professor of mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley at the age of 20. 25, excuse me, 25 for that. Uh, Before the age of 30, he'd be building a cabin in the remote remote wilderness of Montana, transitioning into an eco-terrorist, hell-bent on destroying America's techno-industrial system. Number two, between 1978 and 1995, Ted Kaczynski would either mail or personally drop off numerous homemade explosives that would injure a total of 23 people and kill three others. Number three, the nickname of Unabomber came from Unabomb, and that's U-N-A-B-O-M. The task force the FBI set up to catch uh, Kaczynski, Unabomb stood for University and Airline Bomber because that was where the first attacks took place. It took the FBI almost 18 years to catch him. Number four, the Unabomber was brought down by his own manifesto. I love it. After the Washington Post and New York Times published it in 1995, his sister-in-law and brother recognized the writing and ideals as belonging to Ted and helped the FBI capture him. And number five, new info, Ted's brother, David, David Kaczynski, did get the million-dollar reward for information leading to the capture of the Unabomber, but he didn't keep it. He used some for his brother Ted's legal fees, some for taxes on uh, having, you know, uh, being given the money, and all of the rest was used to establish a special victims fund uh, for, for, you know, Ted's victims. The Unabomb fund was set up to benefit victims of violent crimes committed by paranoid schizophrenics, including Ted victims. So I guess it was open to a few more people in the seven states in which the Unabomber struck. So having, kind of cool, having a dirtbag brother doesn't mean you have to be a dirtbag too. Hail Nimrod, you can't pick your family. Good job, David. Uh, way to make a little lemonade out of those Unabomber lemons. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Unabomber has been sucked. Uh, Ted didn't want his uh, his nature messed with. Didn't want any neighbors. Didn't like the sounds of dogs barking. Should have uh, picked Alaska instead of Montana. Man, go away, go away on the bush. Hike out. Set up camp. Never come back. Good riddance. Good luck out there. No one's going to miss the kind of person that wants to be out there alone. Don't get me wrong. I love nature, man. I, I live around a lot of great nature. Camp every year. Uh, but when I do, I bring my phone. Uh, I listen to satellite radio from my truck. Use my truck to uh, plug in things to blow up air mattresses and such. You know, I, you, you can mix technology and nature. It's possible. They can coexist. You, you took it way too far, Ted. You just didn't like people. That's the truth. You just didn't fucking like people. And they didn't like you. I get it. Uh, thank you to the Time Suck team. Thanks to the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest, uh, Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Access Apparel, and thanks again to Heather Knowledge Ninja Rylander kicking off the research this week. Uh, next week, we stick with true crime, but we look at a different kind of t- uh, case than we've looked at really kind of here before in Time Suck. Casey Anthony. Remember that trial? Such a famous trial. On October 14th, 2008, Casey Anthony was indicted by a grand jury on charges of first-degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter of a child, four counts of providing false information to police, all relating to the death of her young daughter, Kaylee. Kaylee was a little girl about to turn three when she disappeared. Family was living in Orlando, Florida. Casey was living with her mother. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Casey was living with her, uh, her parents, the little girl's maternal grandparents, George and Cindy Anthony. And on July 15, 2018, or 2008, excuse me, she was reported missing in a 911 call made by Cindy, who said she had not seen Kaylee for 31 days. This is so weird, right? She's this, apparently this little girl is living with her mom and grandparents. And then grandma says, oh yeah, oh yeah, I just uh, realized I hadn't seen my granddaughter in 31 fucking days. Uh, she also says that her daughter Casey's car smelled like a dead body had been inside it. Cindy says uh, Casey uh, had, had given varied explanations as to Kaylee's whereabouts before finally telling her that she hadn't seen Kaylee for weeks. Super weird. Casey lies to detectives, telling them that Kaylee had been kidnapped by a nanny on June 9th and that she had been trying to find her, but she was just too frightened to alert authorities. Uh, prosecutors sought the death penalty, and when she was uh, found not guilty, America was shocked. Like the most shocked that it had probably been since, uh, over a verdict since the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, what do experts think happened to Kaylee? What, what what kind of parent doesn't report their daughter missing to the police? It's so fucking shady. 
Uh, do most people still think that Casey killed her daughter? Uh, do I think she did it? Uh, did someone else in her family have something to do with Kaylee's death? It is a fascinating case. Uh, you know, if this would have happened, uh, this would be like a, a making a murderer type case, uh, type docu series on Netflix. If this happened recently, um, and I don't know a lot about it, but I want to learn. So learn with me next Monday, and now learn from your fellow time suckers with some time sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. All right, little note about today's updates. They don't reflect anything from the previous week's show. Uh, Due to my travel schedule, in order to make sure we got this suck on YouTube, because it's important to me to keep a fucking schedule. I like a schedule. Uh, I had to record this episode before last week's suck even came out. Right, so the the Pedro Lopez, I don't know what people are saying about it. Uh, First update, going way back to the gun control episode. Very interesting Christian perspective coming in uh, that I thought I should share from a Christian time sucker, Noah Heepner. Noah writes, excuse me, uh, hello, Master Sucker. I just got into Time Suck about a month ago. I'm now up to bonus 20. You mentioned a question regarding your previous episode about gun control. You mentioned wondering where the desire to kill more is coming from. And in my opinion, as well as many other people from a Christian background, it appears that it comes from an increased belief in evolution. As more people believe in evolution, ever so slowly, especially in the mind of crazy people, our lives are suddenly worth no more than the life or a fish or a bug. This is also not helped by the vegan belief, uh, vegan beliefs that say we should not harm animals because they have souls too, which they do not, nor a conscience. Therefore, they are on the same level as us. So if people can kill a deer or any other animal in their eyes, a human is the same thing. It's sad and it may not, and it may seem put there to you, but it is a very real and a very terrifying possibility. Uh, I hope to talk to you more about such things or things such as this in the future and plan on buying a secret suck or a secret space or subscription as soon as I'm caught up on regular episodes. Thank you, Dan. Love the suck. Well, thank you, Noah. Uh, I appreciate your perspective. It's interesting. Uh, I am someone who does believe in evolution, and honestly, uh, I probably do have a little less respect for the sanctity of human life uh, overall than someone like yourself. Uh, not, not joking. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, though, that, that evolution could be compatible with some type of cosmic creative force or, or being, though, I think that's actually probable, my, my, me personally, some type of God, if you will. I just don't know what that is. Uh, anyway, I can see how a lack of fear over divine retribution and a lack of belief in, in, a, in a God entity that specifically has commanded you to, to not kill, um, you know, that not believing that could lead to more death. However, I was thinking, though, like a fair amount of people who, who kill also kill in, in a misguided belief that they're serving God. So really, I guess, to figure out the answer to this question, we, we need to see like some new mass shooting stats. How many mass shooters have identified as atheists compared to how many mass shooters uh, are religious? If you can find that data, anybody, send it in. I, I really would be curious. Is it uh, kind of evenly split or is it kind of weighted to one side? And, and thanks, uh, Noah, for making me think about that. Uh, now we have the announcement of a new suck baby coming in from time sucker Peter Ordaz. Peter writes, Dear Grand Poobah Sucker and Sheik to all who suck in your name, Denonius Cumulingus. Uh, I have loved your stand-up since day one, and during the time that time I've shown my wife your material. She shares your hatred for all the inconsiderate people, or inconsideration people can show. Yes, good. And the hope that we can, as a society, do better. Mm-hmm. I like her. My wife, Callie Ordaz, was the one who discovered your podcast back when it was still in its infancy and has been a devout sucker ever since. Oh, thanks, Callie. Uh, your weekly podcast have brought us great entertainment where we will listen and pause your show to have intellectual conversations between ourselves. I fucking love that. Uh, where we dive deep into what we both think before hitting play again. I, that's, oh, I love that so much. Uh, it's brought me endless joy to know someone so inside and out, and I can say your weekly investigation into the weirdest shit I've ever heard of is partly to blame. I have one request to ask of you. My wife is pregnant with our first child. Congratulations! Uh, and we couldn't be happier. It would be uh, the greatest honor if you could bestow our first spawn with a blessing from Nimrod to be strong and ever curious of the world, and for the great Bojangles to keep an ever watchful eye over our child. Thank you for all that you do and know that my wife is losing her shit if you are reading this during your great podcast. Sincerely, Peter or Dodge. Well, I hope you lost your shit, Kelly. That's awesome, Peter. Congratulations. Uh, May Nimrod bless your sweet baby. May Bojangles protect it. May you and Kelly raise this baby to be endlessly curious, to not be afraid to dig deep into any issue, to be willing to admit when you're wrong, adapt to new information, to treat others with respect until they cross the line with their ignorance and push harmful agendas. And then may your little one be brave enough not to follow those agendas and maybe call them out on it. And may Lucifina show up a little later, a little later, you know, and, uh, and show your little one, when well, they're no longer a little one, how to have a good fucking time 
on this meat sack biodome of ours. Thank you so much for uh, for sending that in. Now, now we're gonna get a little heavier for the end of this. Uh, this for, this is our first anonymous pedophile island uh, update. Someone wrote saying, Dear Master Sucker, I was listening to the Pedophile Island Suck and thought this was finally a good time to let you in on a slightly different perspective on people who are now considered sex offenders. I ask that you keep an open mind, but please know that I'm definitely not a pedophile myself, nor have I done anything that's come remotely close to assaulting anyone. I was married young to a woman who was of the belief that all porn was cheating, so I kept it away from her while we were together. A few years ago, we separated and I found myself single for the first time since 2002. I started looking at porn again, but it had been a long time since I had last done so. I wasn't super familiar with the streaming options these days, so I was using a file sharing program to get my jollies. The program I used didn't let you see any thumbnails of anything you were getting, just crazy long file names that may or may not be uh, accurate as to what you're getting. That's terrifying. That's never, anybody listening, do not fucking ever use something like this. Truly, never ever do this. Uh, you can't see the video until it's totally downloaded. Yeah, never do this. Uh, Think similar to old school Napster days. At one point, one of the videos I downloaded apparently had someone underage in it to my extreme horror. Of course, I instantly deleted it, canceled all my other downloads. Fast forward to a few months later, I got a call from my girlfriend who I was living with. Apparently, the police were at her house and confiscated my computer and any hard drives I had around the house. They had been running a sting on that particular service, looking for downloads of certain files. I had the bad luck of getting caught in that web at that time that they happened to be doing that. Of course, when you accidentally down something, there's no way to report it so you don't get into trouble. I spent the weekend in jail until I could get bailed out and it took over a year before my case went to trial. After a lot of talking to my lawyer about options, my best solution was to essentially uh, plea no contest. That would end uh, with no jail time. If it went to trial, I would have to convince a jury that it was a one-time accident. But if the prosecution decided to describe what was in the file, it would definitely taint the opinion of the jury. A major uphill struggle that risked me going to prison for 20 years. The day after I'd gotten bailed out of jail, my girlfriend had given birth to our twin babies, so I didn't want to spend their entire childhood behind bars. Now I'm required to register as a sex offender and re-register every six months. In my state, once you're classified as a sex offender, you are one for life. My reason for saying all of this is that there are some of us who uh, out there who are on the offender registry for things that were at least in some way beyond our control. And if you look at my listing, it says sexual exploitation of a minor, even though I never had the slightest contact with anyone in my situation. I beyond despise those who hurt children, and that includes those who simply download videos or pictures of them in sexual situations, but it sucks to be lumped in with them now for life. I just ask that people please consider my situation when hearing someone is now a sex offender. If you read this on air at all, I ask that you please leave my name out, uh, mostly for the safety of those around me. Thank you for hearing me out. Okay, so yeah, totally anonymous. Now, this is tough. This is tough. Uh, I do believe a mistake like that could happen, that could theoretically happen. I absolutely believe that. And I believe that there are other good ways a person could end up on a sex offender registry. Like, uh, this, this is a story I found about a kid named Zach Anderson. Zach was arrested for having sex with a girl he met on a dating app called Hot or Not. This girl claimed she was 17 years old. She admitted to police that she lied about her age after he was, uh, you know, arrested later. Uh, she really was 14 at the time of their sexual encounter. Her mother found out about the sexual encounter after it happened. She calls police. Then when she found out that her daughter did lie about her age, her daughter did look older, she and her daughter both testified on Zach's behalf to try to have him not get in trouble. But the wheels have been set in motion. Zach eventually pled guilty to fourth degree criminal sexual conduct and has to register under the terms of his deal in his state as a sex offender for the next 25 years. Very different Situation than some dude molesting an eight-year-old girl uh, or several family members or some creep raping a stranger in a park still had to re still has to register the same way, get put on the same list. I think it would be helpful to have sex offender registries provide much more uh, detailed explanations of the offender's offenses, like some type of summary of what they did rather than just a vague definition of the charge they were found guilty of. Which, you know, I mean, I do watch the list for, or, you know, around where I live, and it's pretty vague. It's like a mugshot, and then the actual crimes and the dates. I'm sorry, not the, not the actual crimes, like what they were charged with. So just kind of like a, a definition of where their crime would fall, like an umbrella kind of definition of where their, their crime would fall under. It would be nice if it was way more specific, so you knew much more, because it can vary quite a bit. So I feel terrible for you if this was truly just an accident. Uh, absolutely, we, we need to differentiate between truly violent pedophiles and violent sex offenders and others uh, that may have fallen under a technicality that's unfair to parents and the public not to know and also unfair to the guilty party. Yeah, and again, I know porn is so prevalent. I have no judgments about porn. Never fucking open anything 
Never do any weird file sharing things. Uh, never go to the dark web for anything. Never, never Google anything that's questionable. Never, you know, Google like naked young girl, like nothing like that. Stay away from all of that. There is plenty of very legal porn on the internet. Youporn.com. You know, there, there's porn you can buy from adult stores. Like you do not need to risk anything. Never, ever, 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 ever do that. Here's another anonymous message regarding the pedophile island suck. Uh, hello, master suck. I've been listening to this podcast and you're standing up for a long time now. However, this is my first time writing in. I am currently in a uniquely sucky position and the pedophile island suck hit close to home. My family owns a gymnastics center where we teach kids of all ages. It has recently come to our attention that one of the older kids in his teens who is an active member in the gym is currently being investigated for molesting a younger child who also comes to the gym. We only learned about this after being told by the younger child's mother. Because the accused is still legally a child and the investigation is still ongoing, we are obligated to protect the older child's rights. This means we cannot mention anything to other parents or change the way we treat him. It really is a shock to have someone that you know so well to have pos you know, possibly done this. It is even harder to not treat him any differently, especially when he's in our gym so often, which has so many young children. Even if there is a chance that the accusations are not true, I'm uncomfortable knowing he has access to so many small children and we can't do anything about it. I was curious during the episode about how common child-on-child -child sexual abuse occurs, especially since you mentioned that paraphilias stay with a person for their entire life. After digging around a bit, I found that up to 40% of children who are sexually abused are abused by older, bigger kids. I also found that with help, the recidivism rate for children with problematic sexual behavior is fairly low. Hard to find any concrete data uh, as most studies are on adults, but one study conducted by the University of Oklahoma showed a recidivism rate of only 2%. Thank you so much for reading this. If you get this far, I'm a huge fan of the suck. Sorry for the super long message. This particular episode was very impactful for me. Like I said before, I'm a gymnastics instructor. I get to help kids. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be working with them, but to imagine their innocence being ripped uh, apart for someone else's amusement or sick pleasure makes me heart, makes my heart break. Keep doing what you're doing. Hope the suck never stops. Uh, thank you, anonymous sucker. I hope the suck goes on as well uh, for a long time too. Long live the suck. I uh, appreciate you sending me the recidivism uh, stats for children who have some type of pedophilic tendency or some other form of deviant sexuality. Yes, it does seem if you catch it early during the development years when the brain is still malleable that it can be treated much more effectively. This is great information to share because I, I'm, I'm all for curing pedophilia and other dangerous sexual attractions if possible. That's best case scenario. And your message brings us to our final update. Very personal disclosure. I encourage all of you to really hear this one out. It's a tough one, but it's an important one to think about. Another anonymous update says, Hey, Dan, I wanted to reach out and say thank you. Thanks for your most recent time suck. It struck a chord with me for very obvious reasons. I was actually diagnosed with pedophilia when I was a teenager. Luckily, I had parents that were very much involved with psychology uh, academically, and so they realized that in order for me to never hurt myself or anyone else in any way, they needed to, to get me help. I've been in therapy since I was 11, and I'm about to turn 34. Thanks to the therapy, I've never broken any laws or hurt anyone. Only my closest of friends and family know. But it's true. Being able to talk about these unnatural thoughts helps steer one away from repressing them. Repression leads to outbursts that are attempts to purge the fixation. It's also important to tell people that it's not my fault. It's literally how I was born. No sexual abuse in my past of any kind. It's just how my brain works. Much like having a favorite color, you don't really know why. You just like what you like. Thankfully, being able to speak about it in therapy and then openly with my friends and family has allowed me to accept this dark side of myself in a way that makes it basically a non-issue. I'm never afraid of actually being tempted to do something because I never get to that point because I can talk about it anytime I need to in my sessions with my therapist, my friends, and my family. The amount of love and support and understanding that I have has not cured me, but it has eliminated the possible threat I could possibly one day pose to society had I not had it. The point I'm making is simple. We as a society, need to talk about this out loud, in the open, without hate or violence. Only then do we stand a chance of substantially decreasing and altogether, or altogether eliminating the scourge of violence being committed against our world's children. I am here, alive, real, and uh, admitting that I suffer from pedophilia, and yet I have never harmed a child or broke a single law. And that's only been possible because of the love and support I've had from my family, and most importantly, the intervention of a qualified, licensed professional, an active participation in consistent therapeutic treatment. It works. I'm living proof. Obviously, I'd like to remain anonymous, but I tried to kill myself when I'm 16, and I almost succeeded. If it hadn't been for the quick actions of my mother and sister performing CPR, I wouldn't be here today, and I'd just be another statistic. Uh, there are others out there like me, maybe still teens themselves who listen to your podcast. So please keep doing what you're doing. Read this like uh, read this if you 
like so they can know that there is a way out. There are suicide hotlines who can help point them in the direction of therapy they need to save their life and keep them from harming others. This is, in fact, a disorder, which means it's treatable, not curable, but treatable. Talking about it as much as I have in my personal life is what has kept me from being a danger to myself or others. Thanks to the therapy, that impulse is only as loud in my mind as a distant echo of an echo muffled by the love and words of encouragement from my loved ones. This disorder is an evil thing, and I feel you can only counter evil with love, and for me, it's worked. I understand if you block me after this and refuse to read this. I get it. You're a parent, as am I, so I get it. I'm glad I got the therapy I needed. It's made me the father I am today to my son. I can also spot the ones who are like me a mile away. They're everywhere. And I say they because I don't count myself as one of them. I am not a pedophile. I'm a person who suffers from the mental disorder known as pedophilia. Keep on sucking, suck master. I will always be a proud meat sack, even if I'm no longer welcome to be one. Hail Nimrod. Praise Bojangles. All praise to Lucifina. Thank you, Dan. You have no idea just how much good your podcast might do. Anonymous. Wow. Wow. Anonymous time sucker. You and I have already corresponded back and forth. So you, so you, uh, so I know you know this, but of course you're still welcome in the cult of curious. Your message is inspiring that with consistent therapy, you can conquer certain urges. And I'm guessing we all have certain urges, maybe not necessarily sexual to do something bad, to steal, to hurt, to verbally berate, etc. Most of us can control them when we want. I want to bash strangers heads in some days, but I don't do it. If there really is a way to never, ever act on it, then yes, great. You shouldn't be punished essentially for thoughts. And if talking about it helps, we should talk about it. As long as we agree that acting on it even one time is unacceptable and should result in some sort of social banishment, life imprisonment, sent to an island or worse. Because with this disorder, unlike with many other disorders, one lapse is unacceptable. That's what makes it so fucking tough. It's like if you were predisposed to murder, you know, you really want to murder someone, your brain is wired to want to murder, you can control it all the time, then again, you shouldn't be arrested for thoughts, for uncontrollable desires. That's a bad road to head down. That's, that's the, the 1984. That's the uh, brave new world. Thought police, here we come. You know, I don't want to live in that type of dystopia nightmare, but you have to, yeah, you, it has to be 100% batting average. A uh, thousand percent. Thank you for sending in this message. Never stop getting treatment. Thanks for sharing. Who knows who will hear this? Maybe they will hear it. Maybe it'll prevent them from acting on their urges. Maybe it'll help them get the love they need to keep them from harming others. And I'm all for that. And harming others. That's all I want to stop. That's all I want to stop happening when it comes to this very specific issue. Hail Nimrod. Thank you everyone for your thoughts. Let's keep talking. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for today, Time Suckers. Have a great week. Don't mail out any bombs. Maybe don't go off the grid and live in a creepy backwoods cabin with no electricity. I mean, if you did that, how would you be able to keep on sucking? <laughs> hey, hey, what's up? Uh, extra mail? Yeah, for Dan. Oh, shit. Why, why is this self-addressed to me? 